Could we have the doors in the back closed, please? The Committee on Oversight and Government Reform will come to order. The Committee meets today to, cons to hear testimony on regulatory impediments to job creation. Prior to hearing, the Committee will hold a short business meeting to adopt Committee Oversight Plan of the 112th Congress. At the beginning of each Committee meeting, we read the Committee's mission statement. We, the Committee on Oversight and Government uh, Reform, exist to secure two government principles. First, Americans have a right to know that their money, that the money Washington takes from them, is well spent. And second, Americans deserve an efficient, effective government that works for them. Our duty on the Oversight and Government Reform Committee is to protect these rights. Our solemn responsibility is to hold government accountable to taxpayers, because taxpayers have a right to know what they get from their government. We will work tirelessly in partnership with citizen watchdogs to deliver the facts to the American people and bring genuine reform to the Federal bureaucracy. This is the mission of the Oversight and Government Reform Committee. Before considering the over Oversight Plan, I note for the record that pursuant to Committee Rule 6 and with the concurrence of the Ranking Member, I am assigning uh, Congresswoman Jackie Speer of California to the Subcommittee on Technology, Information Policy, and Intergovernment Re Relations and Procurement Reform. The Committee will now consider the Oversight Plan for the 112th Congress. The Oversight Plan describes the subjects that the Committee intends to review, evaluate, and investigate in this Congress. We have, <clears throat> we have tried to draft an Oversight Plan that all of the members of Congress can support. I believe that the Ranking Member and his staff have been fully engaged, participated, found additional items and changes which have been agreed to, and I believe we now have a plan that can be unanimously uh, adopted. With that, I yield to the Ranking Member for his comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and good morning. And I, I want to thank you for your comments, Mr. Chairman. You are absolutely right. And I want to thank uh, your staff and, and our staff for working together on this oversight plan that, uh, and they did it in a very cooperative manner. Uh, we had a number of suggested changes, uh, Mr. Chairman, to the language which your staff uh, and you agreed to, and I thank them for seriously considering our concerns. Although this oversight plan is not one I would have submitted if I were Chairman, I am pleased that you agreed to my longstanding request to investigate abuses by mortgage servicing companies. I think that is so very, very important, particularly in light of what we saw in one of our other committees yesterday, um, the Armed Services Committee, where our service people were uh, uh, being thrown out of their houses uh, illegally uh, by mortgage servicers, and we have seen so many examples of those kinds of things. As you know, the current foreclosure crisis is an, an area that causes me a grave concern, and I know it. it uh, you have similar feelings. And as we heard at our last hearing from the Special Inspector General on Troubled Asset Relief, the performance of these mortgage servicing companies has been abysmal. And so I appreciate, and I really do mean this, your commitment, and I look forward to working with you on this and other issues uh, before this Congress. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I would like to yield to the distinguished lady uh, from the District of Columbia, Ms. Eleanor Holmes Norton. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I am ranking member of a, a subcommittee that is having its first uh, subcommittee hearing, a site hearing uh, out of the building. I did want to uh, correct some information uh, and to comment on the, uh, the, uh, the plan. Uh, the oversight plan states that 35 percent of the D.C. budget consists of Federal funds and leaves the impression that the district is uh, subsidized to the extent of 35 percent. That, of course, is not the case. Uh, Ninety-five percent of this 35 percent consists of what every member uh, in this uh, chamber gets. It is uh, Federal grant uh, money, Medicaid, Medicare, 5 percent, only 5 percent of Federal funds. Uh, from the 1997 Revitalization Act when it became clear that no city, and the district was the only city in the United States, 
uh, that paid for state functions. So the Federal Government pays for some state functions. Uh, for example, the incarceration uh, of, our, uh, felon, of our felons. Um, to the extent that the, the local budget uh, is uh, germane in the Congress, there is the Appropriation Committee and they are the Committee of Jurisdiction. Uh, the uh, oversight plan references uh, the, and is interested in the regulations uh, that the district has issued uh, and references the 2008 Heller decision. The plan should have referred to the 2010 Heller decision where the United States District Court found th that the regulations that the District of Columbia has issued are constitutional. Finally, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we in the district are particularly proud of how the Fenty administration and when he was council chair, now mayor, uh, Gray, uh, reformed the D.C. public schools. The oversight plan references both public and charter schools and monitoring uh, the Fenty administration public school reforms. The, this is classic local home rule jurisdiction and it is being carried out by the mayor and the city council with very tough and knowledgeable oversight that only a local jurisdiction can give to its public schools. Uh, this uh, committee uh, has uh, much on its agenda. I ask the committee to let the city do what the city does best uh, and let, while this committee does what only this committee can do, and I particularly ask uh, that this committee respect home rule in the District of Columbia, and I am grateful that the chairman has indeed uh, respected home rule in the past, and I ask that 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 pattern continue. I thank you, the gentleman, for yielding. The ranking member, would, if the man, ranking member would further yield. I certainly, I yield to the chairman. I thank the gentleman. Uh, for the gentlelady from uh, the District of Columbia, we do continue to believe that home rule is critical. Uh, we take seriously our unique role since the District of Columbia, unlike any city in America has no state, has no oversight by, that you typically would find in a state capital. We intend to fulfill that role without usurping any of the uh, responsibility and rights of the District of Columbia. And uh, the gentlelady and I have worked together for many years on that, and I intend to have no change in, in our roles. Uh, we don't intend to meddle. We do intend to, uh, to view and make suggestions, but at the same time we realize that uh, the money and the responsibility lies with the District of Columbia, and I thank the gentlelady for her comments, and I yield back. I want to, to uh, thank the uh, gentleman for his response to the gentlelady's um, uh, concerns. Um, certainly as, as coming from uh, Maryland, as I do, uh, we are a neighbor, and I know that the gentlelady has spent a substantial amount of time trying to make sure that as citizens of these United States that her constituents have as much independence as possible. And I have often heard her talk about uh, how uh, she thinks it is unfortunate that the Congress spends so much time meddling in their business when they are paying their taxes and doing and don't, and don't have full representation in this Congress as it is. And so I appreciate what the Chairman has just stated. Um, and if, unless the general lady has something else she wants to say, I will yield, yield to her. I, 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 I thank you for those, those comments. I just, uh, and I thank the, the Chairman for his comments. Uh, my only concern is that uh, this committee not become a redundant City Council. It would be unfair. This committee is not equipped to do the kind of literally uh, almost monthly uh, oversight that the District of Columbia does. I think the District of Columbia deserves to be commended for the toughness with which it has carried out public school reforms as few districts have in the United States. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. With that, Mr. Chairman, uh, I will yield back. Uh, I thank the gentleman. I would, uh, I would happily yield to the gentleman who loaned us this wonderful room for today's hearing, Mr. Micah of Florida. Well, thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome the uh, 
uh, Oversight uh, Government Reform and Oversight Committee to the TNI uh, <coughs> hearing room anytime it's available. We need to util utilize it. I commend you on your oversight plan. Want to call particular attention to the provision on federal real property disposal. In fact, uh, the ranking member of our um, TNI uh, Economic Development Public Buildings and Federal Emergency Management Subcommittee, Ms. Norton and I, are leaving for the hearing. We'll be um, leaving the warmth of our TNI uh, committee uh, hearing room here for a uh, empty, vacant federal building where we'll be conducting our first uh, oversight hearing of that subcommittee, uh, just blocks from the White House and blocks from here that sat uh, for years empty. Uh, and we'll be paying particular attention to one of the provisions under your oversight plan, which is federal real property disposal. And I would urge this uh, committee to follow through and work in conjunction with our subcommittee that uh, Ms. Norton is uh, ranking member of uh, uh, to make certain that we are not sitting on our federal assets, such as uh, a, a report outlined by our committee uh, detail last October. Uh, thank you and yield back the balance. I thank, I thank the gentleman. And I will hold open the record till the end of the day for any additional written statements. The Chair will now consider the oversight plan. Without objection, the oversight plan will be considered as read and open for amendment at any point. The plan has already been distributed and should be at each in folders at each of your places. The clerk will designate. The oversight plan of the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform for the 112th Congress. If there is no further discussion, I would move that the Committee on Oversight and Government Reform approve this plan for the 112th Congress. The question is on adopting the resolution. All those in favor signify by saying aye. aye. Any opposed? In the opinion of the Chair, the ayes have it. The, the resolution is agreed to. Um, this concludes the business uh, meeting for today, and we will now go to the hearing if the clerks would uh, make it right for our witnesses. The committee will come to order. I look forward to the hearing today and the witnesses fostering a vigor vigorous discussion. This, this hearing is intended to be a listening session. We are not just saying we want to hear from you. We are going to quickly uh, get to you as quickly as possible. I want to be very brief in my opening uh, remarks. This is the as many people, most people know, the, uh, the week of the 100th anniversary of Ronald Reagan's uh, birth. So I think it is appropriate that we remind us that regulatory impediments to job creation are not a new phenomenon or a new challenge for America. To quote Ronald Reagan, now, so there will be no misunderstanding. It is not my intention to do away with government. 
It is rather to make it work, work with us, not over us, to stand by our side, not ride on our back. Government can and must provide opportunity, not smother it, foster productivity, not stifle it. There is nothing more important than putting today's hearing in the perspective that the, what was said more than 30 years ago by Ronald Reagan is true today, and we hope to find a way to have regulatory reform keep America safe, while at the same time giving up Americans opportunities to get competitive jobs here and in export around the world. With that, I yield to the Ranking Member for his opening comments. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for this hearing. Um, you know, when I, in my district, there are portions of the district where unemployment is probably somewhere around 20, 25 percent. So there is no one uh, who is more concerned about the creation of jobs uh, than I am. And as you know, I fully support a comprehensive, and I emphasize comprehensive review of regulations to make them effective and efficient. Like every member of Congress, we were elected to create jobs, no doubt about it. But we also swore an oath to protect the health and the safety and the welfare of the American people. In my opinion, an effective regulatory review should include several basic elements. It should examine both costs and benefits, develop conclusions based on solid data, facts, statistics, and seek input from a wide variety of sources. I think President Obama took a good first step last month when he issued an executive order requiring agencies to examine the costs and benefits of regulations to the overall economy, to small businesses, and to American workers and families. Unfortunately, the approach adopted by the committee to date falls short of this standard, and I believe we need to take a three key steps to be most effective and efficient. First, we need to expand the scope of our inquiry to include the benefits of regulation as well as the costs. We cannot do a legitimate cost-benefit analysis by collecting information about the cost alone. We also need to expand the groups we are seeking input from beyond those who want the repeal of regulations. For example, no letters were sent to the Council of Institutional Investors, which supported financial protections in the Wall Street Reform Bill, or to the American Businesses for Clean Energy, which represents more than 60,000 small and large United States companies and believe reducing pollution is a, quote, wise investment for long-term economic growth. Second, we need to base our conclusions on facts instead of rhetoric. The country lost 8 million jobs during this recession, primarily because the financial industry was inadequately regulated for decades, not because of overregulation. Third, we need to separate genuine reform proposals from self-serving advocacy. Many corporations that uh, submitted responses to the committee had skyrocketing profits over the past two years. For example, ConocoPhillips' profits increased from $4.4 billion to $11.4 billion. Boeing profits increased from $1.3 billion to $3.3 billion. American Express profits increased from $2.1 billion to $4 billion. Chevron's profits increased from $10.5 billion to $19 billion. That's just over the last two years. Yet, a lot of the responses we received had nothing to do with creating jobs. Companies proposed repealing the following. They, they wanted to repeal these, Mr. Chairman, requiring CEOs to disclose uh, their compensation. They wanted to, 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 to repeal this, give shareholders greater input on executive pay and golden per, uh, parachutes. They wanted to repeal allowing the re return of bonuses when corporate earnings are inflated. They wanted to repeal, and this is one that you are interested in, Mr. Chairman, they wanted to repeal this, encouraging whistleblowers to report abuses to the SEC. And they, did, they wanted to do something else. They wanted to repeal requiring oil companies to disclose payments to foreign governments. The bottom line is this. 
we all, and I emphasize that, we all uh, support a balanced review of regulations. But this committee won't be effective if, if, if its work is incomplete, highlights only costs, ignores the benefits, and puts corporate interests above the health, safety, and welfare of the American people. To conclude, Mr. Chairman, I ask that we focus not just on regulations, but on broad, bipartisan initiatives to promote economic growth. On January 26, the President of the United States Chamber of Commerce, Thomas Donahue, and the AFL-CIO uh, head, Richard Trumka, issued a rare joint statement. They applauded President Obama's proposal in the State of the Union uh, to create jobs by investing in our nation's infrastructure. I ask unanimous consent to place into the record a letter I sent this morning requesting that our next hearing focus on this bipartisan proposal and asking that we invite the Chamber and the AFL-CIO and the Transportation Secretary LaHood to testify this committee, uh, before this committee about creating jobs. By working together, we can help create jobs while protecting the health, safety, and welfare of all Americans. And with that, Mr. Chairman, I yield back. And uh, uh, I ask unanimous consent. Unanimous consent. Any objections? Then your statement will be placed in the record. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I thank the gentleman. Members will have seven days to submit opening statements, including extraneous material for the record. We will now recognize our first panel. Uh, Mr. Harry Alford is President and CEO of the National Black Chamber of Commerce and is oh, I'm, thank you. I will get you in the order that I am reading it. I apologize. Uh, an association representing 95 thousand black-owned businesses and dedicated to the economic empowerment of the African-American communities. Mr. Michael Frederick is President of MCM Composites, LLC, Limited Liability Corporation, I trust, in your State, a not-so-large conglomerate, if you will, of doing custom thermal set uh, molding shop in Minnetowic, Wisconsin, you can tell I haven't been there, that employs 60 workers and has been in business for 30 years. Mr. Jack Boucher is President of Boucher Electric, a full-service electrical contractor located in Minster, and I think that's Mr. Jordan's, Ohio, that serves the residential, commercial, industrial, institutional, and farm markets. Mr. J. Timmons is President and CEO of the National Association of Manufacturers, which represents manufacturers in every industrial sector in all 50 States. And Ambassador Tom Nassif is President and CEO of the Western Growers Association, an agricultural trade association with 3,000 members who grow, pack, and ship 90 percent of the fresh vegetables and 70 percent of the fresh fruit in Arizona and California. I thank the gentleman, and I ask that you all rise. As is the rule of this committee, all witnesses are required to be sworn in. Would you please raise your right hand? Thank you. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you will give, you, that you will give about do you solemnly swear that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Let the record show they all answered in the affirmative. Please be seated. I will eventually get to where I can do that by heart. Uh, We want to allow time for all the members here today to ask questions uh, after they have listened to you. Uh, so I would ask that all uh, witnesses try to limit, regardless of the length of their opening statement in writing, to five minutes. Your entire statement will be placed in the record uh, when, as my predecessor, Mr. Towns, would say, in America we all know that green means go, yellow means caution, and red means stop. So please observe that. Mr. Timmons. the committee. I'm and sorry. Now, could you push down on the button on your yeah, mic and pull it a little closer, please? Yep. How are we there? Very good. Great. Again, thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
The National Association of Manufacturers is the largest manufacturing trade association in the United States, and we represent 11,000 companies, 90 percent of which are small and medium-sized enterprises, and uh, we have 12 million Americans uh, in our, in, that we represent uh, who are employed in manufacturing. Manufacturing means jobs. This year in January, manufacturing added 49,000 jobs, the most in a single month since August of 1998. And in 2010, the United States finished with a net gain of 136,000 manufacturing jobs. These are positive developments indeed, but last year's employment gains still represented a return of just 6.2 percent of the 2.2 million manufacturing jobs that were lost during the past recession. And even for our member companies who are investing and expanding, regulatory uncertainty and costs discourage the addition of new employees. We must always remember that manufacturers in the United States face fierce competition from countries around the world. Every million dollars or what is more likely billion dollars of new regulatory costs that the Federal Government imposes on a manufacturer in California or in Maryland has a negative impact on their competitiveness. My written testimony goes into some detail, so please allow me to just highlight a few examples. For example, OSHA last year proposed a new plan to regulate workplace noise. Even if earplugs effectively protected employees from hearing loss, OSHA wanted companies to install new equipment and structures. In short, rather than spending thousands of dollars annually on hearing protection that actually worked, OSHA would have forced companies to spend millions of dollars to achieve the same results. One of our larger member companies estimated that their costs would have reached $1 billion nationally, a $1 billion that could be more productively used for research and development, capital investment, or jobs. Now, thankfully, OSHA has withdrawn that particular plan in response to strong opposition from employers. But in another example, more than any other agency, the Environmental Protection Agency alarms manufacturers. Just two years after the EPA imposed extremely stringent limits on ground-level ozone emissions, the agency proposed even more drastic rules. According to a recent study by the Manufacturers Alliance, making the current standard more stringent would cost 7.3 million jobs by 2020 and add $1 trillion in new regulatory burdens between 2020 and 2030. Many cities and counties in our nation would instantaneously be in violation of the requirements of the Clean Air Act choking off economic growth in, count, in countless communities nationwide. Another example, the EPA has targeted criti critical equipment for manufacturers, the industrial boiler, for new emission limits that are harsh, inflexible, and potentially unattainable. According to a study by the Council of Industrial Boiler Owners, for every $1 billion spent on complying with these so-called so boiler MACT rules, 16,000 jobs would be put at risk and the United States' gross domestic product could fall by $1.2 billion. Manufacturers of chemical, pulp, and paper products would be especially hit hard. And finally, of course, there is the extraordinary proposal by the EPA to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. The EPA wants to ease into this new regime by limiting CO2 emissions from refineries and power plants. Mr. Chairman, some people believe that massively higher energy costs are a good thing, but manufacturers who use a third of the electricity generated in this country tend to believe otherwise. We understand that higher costs are passed on to consumers, and higher costs makes the United States a less attractive place to do business. Jobs disappear. Communities suffer. Our analysis of the waxman markey cap and trade bill from the last Congress projected a half-trillion-dollar decline in GDP through 2030 and the loss of 2 million jobs. Manufacturers welcome President Obama's recent executive order calling for a review of agency regulations for their costs and effectiveness. We appreciate the administration's recognition of the impact of regulations on jobs, the economy, and small business. The next step must be to act on this recognition to withdraw or modify burdensome regulations. There is not one of us sitting here today who doesn't want to expand private sector employment to create good jobs for every worker who wants one. Any differences that we may have had is really an approach and in perspective. Today I give you the perspective of manufacturers, the men and women responsible for 12 million jobs in the United States, the employers who want to do more but who operate in the real world of unceasing global competition. 
For America and its manufacturers to succeed in this world, these regulatory burdens must be replaced by realism and their costs replaced by common sense. I thank you very much, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. I thank the gentleman. Uh, before I introduce or ask Mr. Nassif to speak, I, I think full disclosure, uh, Ambassador Nassif is uh, the deacon in my church. Uh, he was the ambassador to Morocco, and uh, he is, uh, in fact, a, a personal friend. So I hope that won't diminish the uh, 70 percent of fresh fruit and vegetables that he represents and the thousands of growers. Ambassador? I hope that uh, introduction didn't set me up for uh, You turn the mic on after you finish ribbing me back, please, Ambassador. <laughs> well, good morning, Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. Thank you for the opportunity to appear for you today. Uh, in fact, our members produce about one half of all the fresh produce that is grown annually in the United States. Today, Ambassador, could you pull the mic just a little closer, please? Sure. Thank you. Today, American agricultural production represents a $300 billion market, but we find ourselves in a regulatory environment that is stifling job creation and economic opportunity. Regulations are promulgated without benefit of the best available science and experience. Significant sta stakeholder engagement is lacking. As a result, current requirements are often inflexible and impractical. These include Clean Water Act requirements of redundant pesticide permits, water quality standards which cannot be met, clean air restrictions on particulate matter like dust, Endangered Species Act requirements, and actions taken by the National Labor Relations Board and the Department of Labor, which has introduced uncertainty in our business models, constraining our ability to invest in our businesses, our communities, and to increasing the size of our workforce. And when one out of every nine farm capital dollars invested goes toward meeting regulatory requirements, which in some cases cannot be met, the picture of the regulatory burden becomes clear. This morning I would like to highlight just two examples. The first involves implementation of the Endangered Species Act. California water needs are largely met by State and Federal pumps operating in the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. Litigation under the Endangered Species Act alleged that pumps harmed federally protected fish species, including salmon and a one-inch fish known as the Delta smelt. In 2008, the Fish and Wildlife Service and the National Marine Fisheries Service were compelled to develop new biological opinions governing the pumps. As a result, water delivered to farms and cities were severely restricted during one of California's <coughs> most severe droughts. The results were devastating. In 2009, only 10 percent of the Federal water allocations were delivered. Nearly 500,000 acres of farmland were fallowed. Economic harm is estimated between $340 and $370 million. The number of jobs lost runs into the thousands, and several San Joaquin Valley farm communities suffered unemployment of 40 percent. Water users turned to the Federal Court. In May 2010, the Court repeatedly criticized the National Marine Fisheries Service salmon biological opinion as unsupported by reasonable explanation simply indefensible, inexplicable, and not rational nor scientifically justified. In a separate ruling on the Delta smelt biological opinion, the Court held that the Fish and Wildlife Service did not comply with the National Environmental Policy Act, which required the Service to consider the impact of its regulations on the human environment, and that the specific restrictions on pumping operations were not adequately justified by generally recognized scientific principles. Agencies implementing the ESA must consider the impact of their decisions not only on species, but also upon the economy, employment, and communities. We ask this committee and others to increase their oversight of ESA implementation and to focus especially on the quality of the scientific data used to justify regulatory decisions and the degree to, degree to which the agencies meaningfully engage those economically impacted. Next, I would like to raise concerns about the H-2A guest worker program. This program represents the only avenue for legally employing foreign agricultural workers in the United States. The process is unnecessarily complicated and labor intensive. Approvals are often issued late, notwithstanding statutory deadlines. The delay is compounded by the Department of Labor's continuous demands for wording modifications, which often inconsistently apply or misapply the regulations compounded by visa processing delays by DHS and visa appointment delays by the U.S. consulates, lengthy delays in the arrival of guest workers are commonplace and costly. Even brief delays can be disastrous to producers of perishable agricultural commodities. 
We are especially concerned about the tremendous increase in technicals for minor vi technical violations, paperwork violations, being imposed by the Department of Labor. The program is so complicated, many well-intended employers unintentionally commit technical violations. Nevertheless, the Department of Labor imposes maximum penalties without regard to the seriousness of the infraction, the size of the employer, or the employer's good faith and mitigation efforts. Such penalties, some approaching $500,000, are beyond most farmers' ability to pay and could force them out of business. While employers who violate the law should be punished, the punishment should be reasonable and proportionate. The fines imposed by the Department of Labor are unnecessarily punitive and have the effect of discouraging farmers from using the program. In fact, today, H-2A makes up only 2 to 4 percent of the agricultural workforce. We ask this committee to examine the Department of Labor's administration of this program and its effect on the agricultural industry, culminating in a departmental report to this committee identifying the H-2A program problems and solutions. We acknowledge the need and value of regulations. We merely ask that they be fair, reasonable, and in accordance with the facts and sound science. Thank you very much. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Alford. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Uh, Ranking Member Cummings, I, uh, you have my written testimony. I am going to give examples also uh, of some, uh, some problems. BP is the outlier of the oil industry. The oil moratorium in the Gulf hurts the entire U.S. oil industry. But BP is the only violator of these OSHA, EPA, and mineral mines management uh, violations. If you take all of the violations, the fines, the penalties of the U.S. oil industry combined, it would be a fraction of what BP does in violations. Deaths, injuries, fines by the many millions of dollars are attributed to BP. As a result of the oil moratorium, 20,000 oil jobs are gone. 150,000 related jobs with small businesses in the supply chain and oil industry are gone. BP is the outlier, not the U.S. oil industry. We need to remove this oil embargo. We can put an embargo on BP. They are the ones who are doing it. Secondly, net neutrality. The Internet has been robust and has been successful. It is probably the greatest invention since the telephone. But now the FCC wants to regulate it. It wants to put its claws into the Internet and cease the billions of dollars that the telecoms invest in the Internet and to spread its borders and increase more jobs. The FCC will stop the Internet in its tracks from any further growth if this net neutrality is implemented. The gainful employment rule by the Department of Education, which wants to take away financial aid from for-profit colleges and schools. Forty percent of the students of these for-profit schools are minorities. How can small businesses have an educated workforce if they eliminate 40 percent of the jobs, of the education degrees that would go to these future employees. The gainful employment rule is there simply because for-profit schools are non-union, and they want to strike a blow against non-union schools that also hurt the students. Four, project labor agreements. These are union-only construction jobs. President Bush put a ban on project labor agreements because unions discriminate, discriminate in a Jim Crow fashion. President Obama has reinstated project labor agreements. So when you put a project labor agreement on a project, you're saying whites only, no Hispanics, no blacks, no females. The Department of Labor has these statistics, but they won't release them to the public. And I asked this committee to subpoena the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the racial demographics of construction unions. You get beyond general labor and cement, and you will see Jim Crow discrimination. 
The Congressional Black Caucus should be very interested in this. But when you get to electrical workers, carpenters, roofers, iron workers, it is dismal. So if you have a project labor agreement, you are saying no blacks and Hispanics allowed. The Washington baseball stadium is a beautiful example of that, if you study that. But if you get those statistics from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, it will show. Department of Defense. Major contractors play a game, with, and the Department of Defense is in cahoots with it. One, a floor corporation has a contract, the log cap four contract, which is for Iraq, Afghanistan, multi-billion dollar contract. Halliburton had it before them. They will list and negotiate with black and Hispanic contractors to work on these projects. They will do the scope of work, list it there, and then the SBA will look at that report and says, this is fine. Disabled veterans, minority businesses, women businesses, fine. The only problem is when floor gets the contract, they will never, never utilize those people. It's a game. And the SBA has no juice to make them. And so we got all this false hope going on. Lockheed is another example. Then I'll end. Lockheed had one of my members did the scope of work, did all the agreements, went and got the contract. They actually moved their offices and changed their phone numbers from them. He couldn't even find them afterwards. He complained to the Department of Defense, complained to the SBA. They did nothing. So if you could go back and just get that floor and examine that and do an audit on that, I would appreciate it. I thank, thank you, the sir. gentleman. Mr. Frederick. <clears throat> Am I on here? Can you hear me? Yep. We hear you. All these mics have one thing in common, and that is, in order to not pick up background noise, you have to get close, and that's how they were designed. So please give us a little indulgence. Okay. Uh, our company uh, was uh, started in 1983. I bought it in uh, 2001. We actually closed uh, one month after 9-11. Uh, when I bought it, I uh, took all the cash I had which was $600,000, and I borrowed $5 million. And I personally guaranteed it, and I uh, collateralized that with my home. So I'm interested. I, I, crossed, I, I, I crossed the financial Rubicon. There's no going back for me. This is either going to work or not work. If it doesn't work, I start over at the age of uh, 59. <laughs> the, our, the, from a macro point of view, um, most of our customers, and our customers include uh, big industrial companies like uh, Rockwell, Eaton, Boeing, um, uh, DRS, which is a uh, defense contractor, all of these companies have uh, global sourcing departments. And, and, the, and their uh, mission is to buy components at the cheapest price they can. And most of these large companies don't make these components, they buy them. In, in Boeing, for example, they, they don't make their engines. They, they, they build the aircraft, but all the components that go in there, somebody else makes. And it's small companies like ours that make those components. Uh, so what happens when we become uh, not competitive? And I'll give you a good example. Uh, Kohler engine. We, we, we used to sell a, a 1.2 million uh, head covers to Kohler Engine for their engines, 1.2 million. We did that for, for years. And we sold them for $1.43. And today we make none. They still use them, but those are all sourced in Mexico for $1.18, which doesn't sound like much, you know, a few pennies. But that, that is the kind of margin that uh, companies like ours work on. There isn't a big margin. And the whole point behind that is regulation. And if you believe the numbers or not, you know, the SBA says it's $1.5 trillion. The um, uh, Heritage Foundation says $1 trillion, the cost of regulation. Somebody has to pay for that. Somebody. And that trickles down from or trickles up from whomever uh, we use for uh, uh, services, whomever we buy uh, raw material from. So uh, the point on a, on a macro basis is that that burden is there, and we can't compete 
uh, we, we are competing, but it's difficult to compete if, uh, if we increase that burden. We ought to focus on, on lowering it. I've got uh, two minutes. I want to, I want to make uh, three points on three different areas. Uh, Health care, 1099s. There's a requirement in the health care, and, and this is a, a common topic. Uh, we sent out this year, we just did it, 11 1099s. We have 375 vendors. Uh, it took us three hours to send out 11 1099s, and if you extrapolate that to 375, it's two weeks' worth of work. That's about $2,500 cost for us just to send out 1099s, which uh, produces no value in our company. And it may not seem like a lot to you, but $2,500 is meaningful to me, and it's meaningful to everybody that, that works at our place. That's one issue. The, uh, the Medicare uh, part of, uh, of the health care plan, it has a 3% uh, tax on individuals that uh, make over $200,000. I wish somebody in Washington would please educate members of Congress that small businesses are organized as subchapter S corporations, LLCs, or LLPs. They all pay taxes at the personal level. So when you raise taxes on the so-called rich, you are raising taxes on small companies that are organized in that manner. So this 3.8 percent that's in there is a direct tax um, on our company, if it comes to be. Um, the uh, employee mandate. We have 60, we have 60 uh, employees. I will tell you, and we're, and we're hiring more. I think we'll, we'll, we'll be at 70 by the end of the year. If this goes through, this mandate goes through, it, uh, we will have 49 employees. And we will not have more because we're not going to be uh, subject to this uh, law. We're just not going to do it. Okay, I'm not getting through all my goodies here. Uh, EPA, we talked about the EPA. That's, that's an issue. But the OSHA thing I want to comment on. For some reason, this I2P2 thing, there's, a, there's an implication that, that uh, companies do not uh, uh, properly uh, provide a safe working environment. We have a great incentive to do that. I don't know if you've ever heard of workers' compensation uh, insurance, but we're required to carry it. It costs more for us than our health care. And so we have a strong incentive to have a safe and uh, uh, a productive workplace. So uh, sorry for going over here. I, I thank the gentleman. I realize that uh, much of this will be covered in Q&A afterwards. Uh, Mr. Boucher. Uh, good morning, Chairman Isa and members of the committee. I would like to thank you for giving me the opportunity today to speak with you regarding the impact that the regulations have had on small businesses. I am the owner of Boucher Electric. We are a small electrical contracting business in Minster, Ohio. Currently, we have 18 employees. We are down from 30 employees in 2009. Uh, my business works on commercial, industrial, institutional, and residential properties. There are three specific regulatory issues I want to bring to the Committee's attention today. The EPA led RRP rule, project labor agreements, and prevailing wage rules. Uh, all three of these regulatory burdens have had a negative impact on small businesses and our ability to create new jobs. In 2008, the EPA finalized a rule requiring firms to be certified and their employees trained on lead safe practices during home renovations on homes built before 1978. The EPA eventually revoked its flexible opt-out rule and required all home renovations in pre-1978 homes to follow lead safe practices, thus increasing the cost of renovations for homeowners even though those with no at-risk individuals. Such inflexible standards have the effect of driving down demand for renovation services, or worse, homeowners could seek to have renovations performed by unlicensed underground contractors, which increase the safety risk to everyone. I first found out about this burdensome rule at a recent project of ours. An inspector from OSHA informed the project's general contractor that all subs were required to have on-the-job training in order to be in compliance with the RRP rule. I had to have two of my employees go through a seven-hour certified training course on site. In addition, the general contractor had to arrange expensive training and testing, including a respirator clearance exam, a lead assessment by a certified professional, which cost the general contractor $1,260 a day for three days. 
The overall cost to the general contractor was approximately $10,000. We eventually learned that we, in fact, did not need to be certified or trained to do the work because the concentration of lead dust at the work site was not high enough to pose a risk to anyone. As I witnessed the amount of time and money the general contractor exhausted in an effort to be compliant, I decided that my business would not become an RRP compliant company. The expenses are outrageous, the amount of paperwork is far too burdensome, and the exposure to liability is too great for my business to take on. I am also very concerned about two labor regulations that are also adversely impact small business, uh, project labor agreements known as PLAs and prevailing wage. The Federal Government's insistence on PLAs make it much more difficult for a business like mine to bid on projects. Typical PLAs are pre-hire contracts that require projects be awarded only to contractors and subcontractors that agree to certain pro-union rules. The use of project labor agreements is a discriminatory tactic that prevents non-union construction companies from working on government construction projects. When you consider the fact that the construction industry currently has an unemployment rate of over 20 percent, it makes no sense to impose PLAs or other regulations that serve as impediments to job creation. Uh, we have not personally been directly affected by PLAs over the past couple of years as the projects have either been too large or too far out of our area. However, I am very concerned that if a right-sized project with a PLA does come up for bid in our area, we will be unable to compete for the work, making it even harder for our company to get back on its economic feet. Another area that has adverse impact on small business job creation is the prevailing wage rules. With a slow economy, the last couple of years we have been forced to perform prevailing wage work in order to survive. Uh, these projects, uh, unfortunately we have seven of them going on right now, create a lot of additional record keeping. At the time a prevailing wage project is awarded, my firm has to issue employee notification forms to employees on the job advising the wage rate and applicable fringe benefits paid per hour. Then every week we have to perform time-intensive reporting requirements, such as certifying payroll reports for each prevailing wage job and for the payment of fringe benefits to certified retirement plans. And typically all this work has got to be duplicated because at the end of the project we will be harassed by, by unions requesting an audit on our company that we did not follow the rules. So we just have to double all the time spent and effort on these paperwork requirements and then go through the hearing process. Uh, we've been involved in two of those and have come out clean, but it's still extremely expensive and it's a, a very large inconvenience. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, the committee here for the opportunity to share my concerns with you, and I urge the committee to take a hard look at how the regulatory environment can still for small business job creation and growth. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. I now recognize myself for five minutes uh, for questions. Mr. Boucher, uh, Mr. Alford really talked in terms of the same thing you were, the project labor agreements, the, the fact that our mandating that only union need apply in the trades often creates a situation in which many of the businesses that he represents are effectively locked out of the process. Now, you don't look like a black minority-owned business, so I'm, I'm not sure he was talking about you, but in a sense, isn't that beyond just a regulatory impediment? Isn't it simply the Federal Government agreeing and demanding that something costs more and then paying more? Uh, and, and my point to it is, it's a self-inflicted wound. Government may cost 15 or 20 percent more, but other than locking out Mr. Alford's people, locking you out of the process, is there any, since we are willing to pay for all this bureaucracy and waste and uh, excess uh, overhead, isn't it, in fact, not losing a job but creating just simply ineffective jobs? Well, in, in, in my opinion, sir, the uh, My and, tongue and is in my example. cheek, you understand. Please? My tongue is in my cheek on that question. <laughs> uh, we had a great example in the State of Ohio. The Ohio School for the Deaf and Blind bid a project out in two manners, one with a PLA and one without a PLA. Uh, the project that was bid without the PLA came in 22 percent lower and had six times as many bidders as a job with the PLA. Uh, that is clearly documented. It was public bid opening. Uh, the numbers were read. Uh, I guess taking my business hat off and being a taxpayer, I, I asked the question why. Why, why would you exclude 85 percent of our construction market and our, our members 
and not allow them to bid on these projects. Uh, it just makes no sense to us that this goes on because those 85 percent contractors are performing work on other projects that are not government related on a daily basis without PLAs and are very successful at it and are saving customers money. Um, obviously, from this part of the dais, I agree, and particularly when I look at needing to, tr to crank more than 22 percent of the cost out of government if we are going to balance the budget. Let me go on to a line of questioning. As a former small businessman, I guess a current small businessman, still uh, LLCs and LLPs, I have a question which hopefully each of you can relate. The regulatory cost overall for companies more than 500 employees is rated in this $1 trillion as about $7,635. But for companies under 500, it is estimated to be about 10585 per employee. Now, when I look at that and I look at the figure of $1 trillion into a $17 trillion economy, it looks to me like between 5 and 10 percent is the cost of regulations overall. So I am going to ask each of you a targeted question. Let's assume that we could get rid of just 2 percent of that 10 percent on the back of each of your businesses. What would happen if you could, each of you, whether it is avocados from California or your services uh, on molded products and thermal set products or your contracting, what if you could shave 2 or 3 percent off, not the whole 10 percent? What happens if you shave 3 percent off of your cost of doing business? What does it do to your typical winning or not winning a bid? Mr. Boucher? Well, I, I guess in our situation, whether it is 1 percent, 2 percent, what, whatever we can sh take off our uh, overhead account is going to make us more competitive. Uh, an example, we had our general superintendent retire in the middle of last year, and we did not replace him. Uh, we are doing the work with my vice president and myself. Uh, uh, we didn't have the funds, nor could we be competitive if we put that back online. Uh, right now, I have a a girl that spends about 30 hours a week taking care of prevailing wage reports. Okay. Well, let, let me get to everyone because my time is expiring. Uh, and I will start with Mr. Timmons and come back to Mr. Frederick. For a national manufacturer competing globally, what does 2 or 3 percent do if they can lower the price of their overall product by that amount? Well, Mr. Chairman, it's overall it is 18 percent more expensive to do business in the United States than it is uh, in a country that uh, is a developed economy. So any amount off of that 18 percent allows us to be more competitive. By the way, that 18 percent is uh, derived from the cost of regulation, also energy and torque costs. Sure. It does not include labor. Right. I, I realize it ripples through. So, so every, every percentage decrease in the cost of doing business is, is, uh, allows a manufacturer to reinvest money into its, its company, it allows it to expand, it allows it to create jobs, which is our ultimate goal. Right. And, and I am using the hypothetical number. You can use your own sure. numbers. I but understand. Mr. Nassif, assuming that, uh, that you get water, what does that do for avocados and, and other products competing against Mexico and the rest of the world? Well, clearly, uh, if we have the adequate water supply, we are going to be able to be more productive on the land. And the more you can produce per acre, the less water you use and the less fertilizers and insecticides and pesticides you use. In our industry, we are not price makers, we are price takers. So the retail buyers and the food service buyers tell us how much they are going to pay. Obviously, if we can cut a couple of percentage points, that helps us to be more competitive. But because we are in a global market, we are not competing against the other state necessarily or the farmer next door. We are competing against the world. And in the world, they don't have the same regulatory burdens we have. And therefore, if, if even at 2 percent we are cut, they can still look to another country like China or Mexico or anywhere in the Southern Hemisphere and find a lower price. So then we have to compete on quality and food safety. Okay. Quickly, Mr. Alford. Same question. Uh, just the same genre of, of, you know, if we reduce this down to the portion that Mr. Cummings and I might be able to provide in regulatory relief, knowing you are not going to get all $10,000 per employee off. What do those pieces of two or $3,000 per employee, what does that do for, for it, your, the businesses you represent? And then for Mr. Frederick, we will have to wrap up. It certainly makes it more competitive, makes them more competitive. Uh, they would win more contracts. And uh, winning more contracts from that profit, they would invest back into the company to grow or add jobs. Yes, Mr. Frederick. 
I'll give you a specific. Uh, we're bidding right now on a um, on a uh, uh, water pump cover for uh, Volkswagen. We don't sell it directly to Volkswagen. We sell it to a company called Bocar. Bocar is located in Mexico. That that contract will be awarded on one or two percent on the price of that, and I think we're going to get it. I do because. We're, we're very close, but as you burden, uh, and that, that, by the way, in terms of jobs, that's uh, five jobs, five full-time jobs to fulfill that contract. If we get it, five new jobs. We don't get it, Mexico. Thank you. I now recognize the gentleman from uh, uh, Maryland, and I would ask unanimous consent to be allowed to have two additional minutes. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I want to uh, thank all of you for your testimony. I don't think it's been unreasonable. I think that you highlighted a number of things. And I, too, know what it is, uh, Mr. Frederick, to run a small business. I ran a small law firm for 20 years. I also know, you know the struggles that small businesses go through. Um, and so I want to thank all of you. And as I listen to you, and I, particularly you, Mr. Timmons, I could not help but, and perhaps this would be a subject for another hearing, but when I think about what uh, you know, I think it was well, one of you talked about Mexico. It was, it was you, Mr. Frederick. And I wonder what, you know, when we, those jobs go to Mexico, I wonder what Mexico's standards are with regard to, for example, child labor, with regard to, for example, pollution, things of that nature. And perhaps it might be a good idea, Mr. Chairman, that we begin to look at those things too, because America is better than that. We are better. We set a high standard for the world. And so that leads me to, uh, to talk about a, a witness that is not here today, that I wish he, and I wish he was. His name is Stanley Stewart, and he goes by the nickname of Goose. He is not from my district. He is not from the inner city of Baltimore. He is from West Virginia. And he was one of the few coal miners to survive the explosion in the upper Big Branch mine in West Virginia. Mr. Stewart wrote to the committee to support a proposed regulation to require mining companies to create refuge alternatives during emergencies. I ask unanimous consent that his letter be placed into the record, and I would like to Without read it from objection, now. Without Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. First, Mr. Stewart described the tragedy that cost him 29 friends that day. And this is what he said. He said, I had to stack their bodies and cover them with blankets. I can still see their faces covered in layers of soot so black that I couldn't tell one man from another. Mr. Stewart went on to describe why refuge alternatives are necessary, and he said this, had they been in place during the Sago disaster, those men would have lived. There is no more miserable place to die, in my opinion, than a coal mine. The coal operators can make tremendous amounts of money and still ensure safety of the men and women who mine the coal for their profit. I am just one man whose opinion is against any, many corporate and industry experts, but I am a man who has seen things that no man should ever see. Mr. Stewart concluded his letter by saying this. These regulations that some say should be disregarded in place to ensure the safety of millions of Americans. Regulations do not cut into profit. They protect the people who work to create a profit for a company. Mr. Chairman, I have said it repeatedly that for this committee we cannot focus on just the cost of regulations. We must also focus on the benefits and the health and the welfare of American people. And I know that these gentlemen shared. As I listened to you, Mr. Frederick, I could not help but think back to my days in the Maryland Legislature. I was the expert on, for 15 years on workman's compensation. And I know the cost of workman's comp. And so we have a lot of things that go into uh, why uh, some jobs do not stay here in, in America. And, and so the question then becomes, at some point, what will our standard be? Will we bend to a lower standard? where children are being exploited, for example, so that we can have, so that, so that we can make more profit? I don't know. But let me go to uh, you, Mr. Uh, uh, Alfred. I just want to set the record straight 
Uh, Beats, BP, you said that BP is the, um, was the only company cited for OSHA violations? No, sir. I, All right. What did no, you say? I, I said if you take the U.S. oil industry and their violations combined, it would only be a fraction of the total of BP's fines. All right. I want to make it clear. Uh, on October 9, 2009, OSHA cited Conoco Phillips for repeat workplace safety and health hazards. On that date, OSHA cited Conoco for three repeat violations and four serious citations. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> June 2010, OSHA cited the firm Infernium, a joint venture between Shell and Exxon, for 22 workplace safety violations, including exposing employees to chemical hazards. Uh, and I'm going to just stop there. But that's why I wanted, and I think the chairman will agree uh, that we, you know, we we got to hear the whole whole, whole story. So now, now let me just go. I'm, I'm, I'm all, I have another question for you, okay. uh, sir. Um, I'd like to ask, and all the witnesses, I've asked to w ask you this. In the State of the Union, the President proposed an initiative to promote economic growth by modernizing the nation's infrastructure. On January 26, the United States Chamber of Commerce and the AFL-CIO issued a joint statement supporting this proposal. It's rare when these two groups agree, but this is what they said, quote, whether it is building roads, bridges, high-speed broadband energy systems in schools, these projects not only, not only create jobs and demand for business, they, all, they are an investment in building the modern infrastructure our, our country needs to compete in a global society. And so, Mr. Alfred, since your organization works closely with the United States Chamber of Commerce, do you not? I'm on the board of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, sir. And so I assume that you would support these proposals, would you not? It depends on the particular proposal. Uh, uh, I, would, it would, I don't want project labor agreements. That's certain. So Nor does the U.S. Chamber. So we're talking about the, the, the organization. You sit on the board. Did, you, did that come before you, by the way? I'm just curious, as a board member? Let me clarify something, please, on the U.S. Chamber. Sure. What the President has done, they were talking about high-speed rails. The U.S. Chamber agreed with AFL-CIO that the nation needs high-speed rails. It was not a broad general statement saying all the infrastructure should go together, or as you put it, we're in concert with the AFL-CIO. We are not. We don't believe in car check. We don't believe in project labor agreements. We don't believe in a lot of things. Well, as my time runs out, and I, I want to thank you for what you just said, but I'm just reading from the joint statement. It says, we, whether it's building roads, bridges, high-speed, broadband, energy systems, schools, these projects not only create jobs and demand for business, they are an investment in the building the modern infrastructure of our country needs to compete in a global society. I see my time has run out, and I want to thank the chairman for the uh, additional two minutes. You are most welcome. I would ask unanimous consent that uh, Appendix 1 from our preliminary staff report on all of the submissions uh, be placed in the record at this time. Uh, so that there is a complete list of all the complaints, not one of which was about mine safety. Without objection, so ordered. I now recognize one of our two chairmen of this committee present here today, Mr. Burton of Indiana. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, I would like to just briefly respond to my good friend from Baltimore, for whom I have great respect. Uh, there is no question that we must have uh, some regulation. Uh, because uh, we do have tragedies that occur because we haven't really uh, paid enough attention to them. But the other side of that coin is we must be competitive if we're going to get market share in the world. Right now, our trade deficit is huge, and one of the reasons that uh, we have such a huge trade, trade deficit is in many areas we cannot be competitive because regulation is strangling the private sector. And so we have to be very careful when we regulate something that we don't uh, uh, put ourselves in a non-competitive uh, situation uh, while at the same time being concerned about, uh, about the people that uh, are in the workforce. Uh, one of the things that concerns me is something that may come down the road. We have been watching in, in Egypt, in the Middle East, the problems over there, and uh, we know that that could explode into a situation where uh, the Persian Gulf and the Suez Canal might, might down the road be blocked. And we get about 30 percent of our energy from there. We get about 20 percent of our energy from uh, Venezuela or thereabouts. So we are dependent on foreign energy. Uh, in the last session of Congress, we, we blocked the cap-and-trade uh, uh, regulation. 
Uh, and we did that because we felt it would put us in an uncompetitive situation. And I'd like to get your opinion uh, about this because right now we understand the, uh, uh, the Department of Energy and the Environmental Protection Agencies are talking about passing a regulation which would parallel the cap and trade that uh, did not pass the last, last session of Congress. In other words, they are going to try to circumvent the Congress of the United States and put this into effect. So I would like to know, based upon uh, your experience with regulation, what would that do to the private sector and, uh, and uh, production in this country, and how would it affect our competition worldwide? Any one of you can answer. Yes, sir. I will start off with that. It would transfer private industry to overseas. We would see a mass exodus, exodus of firms going abroad because it costs too much to do business in the United States. There would also be a transfer of wealth going from the United States elsewhere. There is a national security problem with this, too, and that the United States, which is number one in the world today, would probably fall to five, six, seven, or eight. If we fall to eight, then we create more enemies who see us as being vulnerable. This is cap and trade coming through the back door. Yeah. We defeated it already. The American people don't want it, and we need to check EPA. I talked to uh, one of my uh, uh, companies uh, that manufactures and uh, does a lot of business overseas, and they told me that if cap and trade passed the electric bill, the generation of uh, uh, the energy they need to generate their product, uh, we'd go up $100,000 a month. And, Mr. Frederick, you do business uh, in other countries. How would this affect uh, your company if we had to add the cost of cap and trade uh, to your business? Uh, it, we, we have a situation in Manitowoc where the city, the city of Manitowoc, owns the public utility and they actually generate power. They have a power plant and it's, uh, they use coal to fire the boilers. Our monthly electric bill is uh, about between $22,000 and $25,000, without question. We are we're pushing thirty, dollars if, if, if something like that happens. You know, it would be like $10,000 a month, $120,000 a year. For what? For what? We buy the same amount of electricity. We produce the same product. It's just now we have another burden of one hundred and twenty thousand. Well, what would that do to your competitive uh, situation? As far as you, you mentioned Mexico a while ago, and you were within a few cents of getting a contract, what would that do to businesses like uh, business like that that you would get? It 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 kills you. It kills you because we cannot compete on wages, nor do we want to compete on wages. Uh, but we we can compete on efficiency and the use productive use of capital. And the projects that we bid on are so tight, they are they're 1 and 2 percent. So to the extent that we uh, are, are 2 percent off, we don't get the business. Let, let me just end up, Mr. Chairman, by saying that the gentleman, Mr. Frederick, just mentioned a while ago that uh, the health care bill would cut his uh, employment from 60 to 49. So you are looking at a maybe a 10, 12, 14 percent reduction in employment if the health care bill goes into effect. And I think that is another thing that we ought to throw into this regula regulatory uh, mix and, and, and issue. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the other chairman of this committee, Mr. Towns. Thank you very much. Let me thank you, Mr. Chairman, and of course, and the ranking member for having this hearing. You know, let me just sort of go down the line. Um, when agencies propose new regulations, there is a public comment period. Uh, just go down the line. I want to know if whether or not you participated in that comment period, starting with you, Mr. Timmons, and just go right down the line. Sure. Thank you, Congressman. Yes, uh, we, we often participate in the comment period, and not just as an association, but our members oftentimes uh, provide comments as well. Was there a response? Did they respond back to you? It depends on the agency. Depends on the agency? Sure. Sometimes the, the comment period is so truncated that there really isn't enough time for meaningful dialogue or for, uh, for response. Uh, oftentimes the, the comment period is about 60 days, and because of the massive amount of, of uh, comments they receive, it is hard for them to, to respond to all of, the, all of the input that they receive. We try, as far as agriculture is concerned, we try to respond 
uh, to any regulations uh, or proposed regulations, rulemaking that goes out uh, on any matter that is related to agriculture, and sometimes those are just that are related to uh, business as a whole. Uh, we have uh, generally gotten very good responses from uh, the Department of Agriculture in this way, but a lot of the other agencies uh, have not been responsive or limited in their response. The problem is, is that the comments we make are in most cases uh, not included in the final draft of the regulations, and we have to go up and argue specifically because most of the time agriculture is forgotten when we are making regu regulations, just like health care. No one even considered it, agriculture, the fact that we have a temporary migrant workforce uh, in promulgating health care legislation. So we have to fight very hard to be heard on those matters. Yeah. Mr. Alfred. Probably we have done 40 comments in the last year. Uh, mainly to the SBA, FCC, Department of Interior, EPA. I can't recall ever getting any feedback back from any of them. So you feel that basically whatever your comments are, are totally ignored? I don't think they are ignored. Uh, what do you think? <laughs> they, they talk about it and move on. Their mind set, basically. Okay. They don't, you know, comments that differ from their opinion are rarely uh, effective or make a difference. But we do comment. Mr. Frederick? Uh, I am actually too busy to keep track of that stuff. I really am. Uh, fortunately, we have uh, uh, other entities like uh, SBE Council, and if something comes up that they think will affect the manufacturer, they will always call and say, uh, Mike, uh, you are on the front line of the free market system. What is this going to do to you? And I will give them an answer. So I always comment. Mm -hmm. You feel that it makes a difference whether you do or don't? Yeah, I think it does. That is why I am here today. I paid out of my own pocket to uh, be in front of the committee, and I, I absolutely do think it makes a difference. Right. Mr. Boucher? Uh, kind of in the same boat. We are as small as we are. I don't have the time or resources to follow up on all those types of things, but I do comment on a regular basis back to our trade organizations, such as the NFIB or the Associated Builders and Contractors or the Chambers, uh, any time these issues come up and they pose something in front of us. And I have full confidence in those organizations that they do bring the message back to the proper chambers and, and follow up with those types of issues. Let me ask you this before my time runs out. Uh, are there any areas that you feel that we should uh, really push in terms of regulations? Yes, uh, Mr. Frederick. And be brief because I am running out of time. <laughs> I will be very brief. Tort reform. It is a burden on every producing company in this country, and it is skimming wealth. Okay. Uh, Mr. Boucher? Uh, project labor agreements. Project labor, okay. Mr. Alfred? I agree with both those answers. They are equally important. I would say making sure that regulations. I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm having trouble hearing you. Push your button. I would say that making sure that the regulatory process engages good, sound science and peer review, and engages the stakeholders in these conversations so they understand the real world side of business. Right. Thank you, Mr. Timmons. And, and Mr. Towns, I'd I'd echo all of those statements and and uh, uh, say that there are a number of regulations that that need to have some very thorough review to make sure that they do apply sound science principles. I did want to get back to your first question, though, because I think there is an example of how, uh, how the process has worked, and, uh, uh, at least from our vantage point, and that is the OSHA noise proposal that I mentioned earlier. Uh, there were a number of employee, employer comments uh, that came back, and OSHA did withdraw that proposal uh, because, frankly, it didn't make, it didn't make sense. That said, the fact that the proposal was promulgated in the first place gives us pause. And so we, we are interested, obviously, in how the regulatory process is, um, uh, is undertaken at, the, at, the, uh, at various levels of, of agencies. So I did want to comment that it sometimes does work when, when comments are made and when there is a large outcry from, mm -hmm. from the employer community. Right. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, let me say, I, you know, as I yield back, um, I am very interested in creating jobs. My area is high unemployment, but I am also concerned about throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I am concerned about that, too. So I yield back. 
I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Gosar, for five minutes. Gentlemen, coming from an area in Arizona um, that has uh, got huge unemployment needs um, from Native Americans all the way through the private sector, um, let me ask you the question. Um, of all the regulatory burdens um, and agencies, which one is least based on sound science? Well, I will start. Um, I am not sure that I want to handicap that, <laughs> Congressman, but I will say that because uh, the EPA is uh, uh, promulgating probably more regulations than, than any other agency impacting manufacturers, we find ourselves uh, uh, contesting a lot of the, the measurements that are used uh, in, as they draft their regulations. So uh, that is the, that's the one agency that I, I think we find ourselves uh, trying to monitor the most closely. For agriculture, I would say that in addition to the EPA, that it is really the, uh, the Department of Interior and how they enforce things like the, and define the Endangered Species Act. We find, as I testified, that in many cases they come up with their own scientific results, which when they are challenged by peer review or when they are challenged in court, they are found to be based on poor science and they need to redo the science. So I think what happens is they develop a, a certain intellectual bias towards a certain position. For example, if they work in there, perhaps they are more biased to, toward wildlife than they are toward the economy or the human environment. And that is where we run into problems, is we don't have that blend of interests. I would say the EPA, and we have been engaged with the EPA on issues since 1996, and we have gone from global warming, then the winters came and the hurricanes came back, now it is climate change, but it is the same dog and pony show. And, and Senator Inhofe is uh, going to put out a book called The Hoax, and I am anxious, anxiously awaiting for its release. EPA, without question, uh, two examples. Uh, wind farms. Wind farms are an absolute uh, example of 21st century uh, uh, silliness. And ethanol. Ethanol, uh, in, in coming from Wisconsin, we have lots of farms. Why we uh, produce corn to convert into ethanol, which reduces uh, gas mileage uh, on automobiles, uh, I will never understand. I also would agree the EPA. Um, I can't say I'm directly affected. The industry we work for, the customers we have are directly affected, and therefore it does hold them back from expanding or moving forward with projects that they, they'd like to uh, add to their uh, business base uh, simply because of uh, unreasonable and unachievable regulations. Second question, how much time do you spend um, in uh, trying to adhere to the regulatory burden in your um, businesses? Well, we have 11,000 members, Congressman, and uh, I can't give you a, an average, but it could be anywhere from hours to days, and I would defer to some of the individuals who are running companies directly. I would say that uh, at least 10 percent or more of the time is spent just trying to comply with the regulatory burdens because that is about, uh, the, about the cost of complying with them. It is a big trouble. 98 percent of our members are very small businesses uh, with limited accounting and legal uh, support. And many times they get fined and get in trouble for uh, being late or inaccurate with their reporting. I uh, will give you a real life example. Um, uh, EEOC complaints. Um, we had uh, two of them. One was from a Hispanic woman who uh, claimed that we uh, 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 terminated her because she was Hispanic, and another one was from a uh, white male who claimed we terminated him because he was an American. Now, each of those uh, two cases, both of which were uh, not valid, and, and we ended up winning. Um, took uh, at least one week of my time, my personal time, to just complete a response to those and, fill, and getting all the information and responding to the EEOC and, and, and uh, their documentation request. 
And for the price of a, a 44 cent stamp, you can file one of those, and we have to uh, respond to it. I would say in my business, we're, we're probably looking at least 20 percent. But, but most importantly, these regulations are so in-depth and so large that we have got to pay outsiders, whether it's attorneys or business organizations or what, to really critique these regulations and advise us as to what we can and what we cannot do. And that takes money away from my company being able to expand or hire additional people. I'm spending it on uh, the, the attorneys or business groups helping us try to understand the regulations. I thank the gentleman. We now go to the gentlelady from New York, Ms. Maloney, for her questions. You are recognized for five minutes. Okay. Thank, thank you very much. And I thank all the panelists for coming and, and your testimony. And I would like to uh, direct my questions to uh, Mr. Timmons. In your written report on page 13, you express concerns about the Con Consumer Product Safety Commission's product safety information database. And I would just uh, like to add that this database will provide public access to critically important information for consumer safety. And my hope is that this committee will re review this uh, regulation and listen to Mr. Timmons' uh, concerns and input. But however, before we can go forward, we really need to talk about other people who should be part of this discussion, and that's the consumers that benefit uh, from this database. And I would like to speak about Michelle Whitty, who wrote to this committee and told us about waking up one morning on December 12, 1997, and finding her son, Tyler Jonathan, uh, strangled to death in a drop-side crib. Uh, she said that she continued to go to stores for years, and they were selling this crib and saying it was their number one safety product. And uh, then she inquired about whether or not they knew that children had died in, in it, and they would say, of course we wouldn't sell it if we knew that children had died in this crib. Um, un unfortunately, many other children died in this crib. Another uh, woman who is missing from the discussion today is uh, Lisa Olney. Elisa's 13-month-old daughter, Ellie, died in a poorly constructed, designed, portable play yard. And she wrote to this committee and said that it took nine months for the Consumer Product Safety Commission to release the story of her daughter's death. And she wonders how many other stories are sitting in inboxes and not getting out to the public. So I believe their stories are important, and I ask uh, unanimous consent to place it in the record. Without objection, so ordered. Thank order. you. And uh, Mr. Timmons, my question to you is uh, when we review this regulation and talk about it and go into further discussion on it, do you agree that testimony from consumers such as Michelle Witte and Lisa Olney should be part of the discussion? Okay, thank you very much. I also I think those are very important uh, uh, points of information, Congresswoman. And I, I have a one-year-old daughter myself, so I, I am very acutely aware of thank you. some of these thank issues. You. And I think it is important. And I th we we support the database. We just want to make sure it's done in a, in a and I also manner. would like to place in the record. Uh, testimony from the Kids in Danger. And this is a not-for-profit dedicated to protecting children from faulty consumer products. It was founded by parents who found their son uh, dead in a portable crib, and uh, they want to work to get the information out. I, I relay these stories because these regulations affect uh, real people and, and has a real significant benefits in protecting consumers and people in our society that cannot uh, be measured by merely a cost uh, a profit uh, side or a tally sheet. It, it is there to protect people and it should be part of the discussion and, and, and part of the decisions. And these mothers, Mr. Chairman, uh, and these families deserve an S investigation and consideration uh, that looks at both the costs and the benefits of these regulations. And many of these regulations, such as the Consumer Product Safety Commission's uh, database, are there to inform constituents, inform consumers, and really make our country uh, safer uh, for our children. Uh, so I wanted to make sure that was part of the uh, discussion. I thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman. It clearly, um, we support product safety. It is very important for the brand uh, 
the brand reputation of our manufacturers. We have supported additional resources for the CPSC, and we look forward to working on a, on a database that makes sense for all concerned. Thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Meehan, is recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Timmons, let me ask you a question uh, right from the outset, please. There is uh, uh, the President issued regulations from the administration stressing the importance of giving uh, 60 days notice and comment. We have heard some questions about this issue, and we have heard a lot about EPA. What has your experience been with EPA's abiding by that regulation, that, that, that request? 60 days oftentimes is not, uh, is not adequate, uh, first and foremost. But uh, with w the experience of manufacturers with the EPA has not been a particularly um, um, harmonious one. Uh, and it is not, in, in all candor, it's not, it hasn't just occurred in this administration. The last administration was uh, very difficult to uh, have meaningful conversations with. I was, uh, I was Chief of Staff of a State Government uh, in the 90s. And one of the things that we attempted to do was to have a collaborative relationship with our regulating agencies, our environmental permitting and regulating agency, with the business community, because we all agreed that we wanted cleaner air and cleaner water. And we found that the best way to achieve that was to, uh, was to work together to achieve those goals. Now, it didn't always work, and sometimes uh, businesses had to be um, uh, uh, they, they had issues that, that could not be resolved in a collaborative way. But we did find that, that when we worked together, we were able to resolve issues uh, quickly and achieve goals that, uh, that did not harm the economic competitiveness of our State. And we would like to see that be the case with EPA. We are happy to see the President's uh, regulatory executive order. It doesn't apply necessarily to the EPA, but uh, we think it is a step in the right direction. Well, if you could help me to the extent that you can by asking some of your constituencies to give us a record on that, because I know the issue arose today and I was in preparation for this. I have a letter from uh, Charles Travana, who is the president of the National Petroleum and Refiners Association, and I am quoting his language. Uh, in relation to chemicals regulation, there has been little transparency into the regulatory process in the EPA in recent years. For example, for example, EPA no longer holds public meetings when crafting regulations. In the past, they routinely held public meetings. So I know this is an issue. I have two refineries, 2,000 direct jobs in my backyard. We keep talking about sending jobs overseas. We are competing with refineries overseas that it is cheaper for them to send oil refined from Nigeria into my backyard than it is for my refineries to do that. And those 2,000 jobs are teetering on the line by virtue of these EPA policies. As I have talked to the folks down here, we are getting so many mixed messages. One, you talked about working together. Uh, they are giving regulations for, for, for greenhouse gases, but, but vague guidelines. You talked about BACT, which is the best available control technology. They are delaying any kind of interpretation on this and then opening the company to the extent that if they put in something, that can be litigated later that it wasn't the best available technology and it will require the company not only just to litigate this, but they can lose the benefit of the investment that they have already made. Well, that is an example of... Uh of a regulatory process that really doesn't make sense. And one of the things that we have, uh, that we have advocated as the National Association of Manufacturers is that, uh, uh, as I mentioned before, it is 18 percent more expensive to do business here in the United States. Part of the reason for that is our regulatory burden. And we believe that, that our goal should be, and the goal of policymakers should be, that this is the best country in the world in which to headquarter a, a, a corporation, that it's the best company or best country in the world in which to practice and uh, 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 research and development, and that we need to be obviously the best country in the world in which to manufacture so that we can export our products. The only way to do that is to have um, lower costs for manufacturers, including regulatory burdens and common sense regulatory processes that uh, don't have manufacturers saying it doesn't make sense to do business in this country anymore. I know that Boeing is one of your, 
constituents as well, congressmen, and uh, every day they're, they have to uh, uh, spend a tremendous amount of their resources trying to ensure that they comply with regulations and, and uh, uh, they spend an enormous amount of resources in doing that. Um, you use the language common sense, and yes. it is something that we all, we all care about. We air do. quality, to be sure. We need to focus on it. But CAA regulations right now in my very refineries are requiring the, fil the facilities to install advanced technologies. But by virtue of doing that, they are going to use more energy than they currently do for the process. Then they are going to be penalized for the greenhouse gas that is associated with the very technologies that they are being required to put in by the EPA. Where is the common sense in that process as the result of that means that those jobs are going to be competing with a Nigerian oil that doesn't have the same requirement that is going to take that market away from the workers in my district. Yeah, I don't think you would see me uh, defending that as, as a common sense move. So, May I just I, ask I think, one last question, Mr. Chairman, which is winners and losers. They have picked two industries when they have decided EPA so far. is uh, refineries when they were re required to do the uh, uh, new source performance standards. H how can agencies pick winners and losers in the private market with, guess, with regard to which right. regulations that the, the gentleman can answer briefly. Well, I think the bottom line, Congressman, is they shouldn't. And the free market should be allowed to determine um, who is going to succeed in our economy. And by so doing, I think we will we'll end up uh, creating long term economic growth. Thank you. The gentleman from Cleveland, Ohio, Mr. Kucinich, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In a recent letter to the Wall Street Journal, a group of powerful utility companies, including Pacific Gas and Electric, Exelon Corporation and Constellation Energy Group, stated that in their experience, quote, regulations can yield important economic benefits, including job creation, while maintaining reliability, unquote. As we are looking for innovative ways to create more jobs, we should consider that regulations can create jobs. According to The Economist, Evan Goodstein, the one, this is a quote, the one comprehensive estimate available suggests that in 1992 just under 4 million jobs were directly or indirectly related to pollution abatement and environmental protection in the United States, unquote. In addition, a report issued this week by Saris and the Political Economy Research Institute found that certain EPA rules proposed under the Clean Air Act, quote, will lead to a net job gain, unquote, in 36 eastern states evaluating this study. The report also finds that between 2010 and 2015, capital investments in pollution controls and new power generation will result in 1.46 million jobs. Mr. Timmons, in your testimony, you expressed concern about the high cost of pollution abatement. I understand that these costs are difficult for a company, especially a small one. But there are studies now that say that the ultimate effect is a net increase in jobs. Would you uh, dispute that as a possibility? Well, I would say that, uh, uh, I would say that when we evaluated the uh, cap-and-trade bill from the last Congress, uh, we did a uh, our study was, was a net study, and it showed a 2 million job loss. What about these uh, other studies? I mean, do, do you dispute that these studies have any validity at all? Well, I can tell you what our study said. But, but what about these other studies? Do you look at any other studies? You only know your studies. I haven't seen those particular studies. Okay. Would you be interested in those studies? Send them along. I'd love to see them. Good. I will. A 2009 study conducted by the Center for American Progress found that compared to overall spending in the economy on a per dollar basis, spending on environmental protection and cleanup employs more than twice as many workers in construction, uh, 11 percent versus 4 percent and 25 percent more in, in manufacturing, 20 percent uh, versus 16 percent. This year, the Bureau of Labor Statistics 2011 Employment Survey data shows that the manufacturing sector added 49,000 jobs in January, up from 9,000 in January of last year. So the, the, I bring this up because I think it is important that we have a serious discussion about job creation while factoring in studies that are available that shows that in some cases um, regulations can create jobs. 
And I don't think we can have a serious debate about uh, the cost of regulations, including EPA regulations, without acknowledging their positive impact. And, and there is another element here that doesn't get much discussion, and that is um, when we are talking about the benefits of regulation and the positive effect, even job creating effects of regulation, uh, I, I think if, if you are looking at the cost of regulation, you need to monetize the benefits of regulation, particularly with respect to public health. Because if an industry is creating pollution that ruins someone's health, that, in effect, is a, a payment that that individual person is making to that industry with their health. That is a cost shifted onto the society. So I hope that as we get into this discussion about regulation, we, we take a broader view about cost-benefit. And, uh, and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. The Chair now recognizes Mr. Gowdy for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Frederick, how are you? If, uh, dandy. <laughs> uh, if my information is correct, uh, your company was able to come back from the brink. Um, can you tell us uh, how you accomplished that, whether government was helpful or not helpful? Um, tell us about your odyssey back. Well, well, the government was helpful in putting us to the brink, but not helpful in getting us out. And uh, I, I, I dispute this whole uh, financial regulation issue about why the financial sector crashed. I mean, it was uh, uh, bad loans that were made, which ultimately triggered this whole thing. And that, that's what caused uh, a problem for us in 2009. We were running um, two days a week, three days a week. Uh, our salaried people found out what it was like to have a get paid for two days a week and not their full salary. Uh, but it was just sheer uh, the ability to cut back our internal cost. And we did it on the, on the backs of everybody, including myself. I still haven't raised my uh, draw back to where it was in 2008, because I can't afford it. Um, so everybody, everybody felt the pain, but it was all labor. It was, uh, and really, when you want to cut something in a hurry, that, that is what you have to cut. There is no way around that. And what you cannot cut is what we are talking about here today, which is uh, burden, regulatory burden. That is a fixed cost. It is so fixed that uh, you can't even identify it to, to uh, cut it. So uh, we did it through uh, guts, guts. Everybody, everybody had the, and we didn't lose any people. You know, was, the economy was so bad that, you know, we didn't have uh, people uh, uh, leave and go somewhere else. There was nowhere to go. So, uh, fortunately, we kept our, our core group together. Well, um, uh, thank you, and we commend you, Mr. Timmons. I come from a state, South Carolina, that. Um, while we have a lot of manufacturing jobs, we have lost a lot of manufacturing jobs, and particularly in the upstate of South Carolina. Can you give me some specific examples of particularly pernicious regulations that are impacting the manufacturing sector? Uh, I know about tax. I know about the litigation. To help me with the regulatory side, um, what can we change to help uh, create manufacturing jobs or keep the ones we have in the upstate of South Carolina? Well, I think. I think the most important thing we can do at this juncture is to ensure that additional regulations that are costly do not get imposed on manufacturers. Because as I have uh, stated earlier, uh, and you have just mentioned as well, uh, the overall cost of doing business in the United States is 18 percent more expensive than it is among our major trading partners and, and developed economies. That cost in, it does not include the cost of labor, because we believe that that uh, a higher standard of living is desirable. It does include, however, um, uh, in addition to energy cost and torque cost, it does, does include regulatory costs as well. I, I welcome the President's executive order because it asks all agencies to look at the regulatory burden overall and, and evaluate each regulation's impact, existing regulations' impact on jobs and the economy. I think that that study will help us determine exactly where changes can be made. When I, was, uh, uh, when I was in State government, one of the things that we chose to do was to evaluate literally each and every regulation. Uh, it was the State of Virginia, and we were constantly competing against the State of South Carolina to see who could be the most competitive. 
And uh, we, we chose to look at every regulation on the books, and 75 percent of our regulations over this three-year period were either um, um, amended or, or eliminated so as to make the uh, economic environment more, more conducive in Virginia for, for investment. So uh, I think the first step is, is this executive order, and, and uh, we'll see what that produces. Uh, I've, I've indicated several regulations that we have concerns with in my written testimony. I'd be happy to provide an, another copy of that, but it is a rather lengthy list. Um, and uh, we can also get you some specific costs uh, I've only got 30 seconds. Let me ask you one more question. My, my constituents are in one accord that uh, regulations are stifling their ability to create jobs. They are about equally divided on whether or not those are unintended consequences or whether it is part of a, a broader scheme to get through uh, regulatory mechanisms which you cannot get through legislative mechanisms. Uh, what is your judgment on that? Are these unintended consequences or, or is this uh, getting through regulation which you can't get? In elections, there are many regulations on the books that have uh, come about through the regulatory process and not through congressional action. That is for sure. Um, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency is talking about a they have a proposal to regulate greenhouse gases that clearly did not make it through the legislative process, and it would be an example of of of. Uh, legislating through regulation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. The gentleman from Chicago, Mr. Quigley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, in the 112th Congress, this is now my third meeting already that I have uh, participated in regarding regulation, and I appreciate that because uh, regulation is important. Um, we are starting to see themes in these meetings, though, that uh, regulation is important, but it is a process and there is a balance involved. And I, too, Mr. Timmons, agree with the President's uh, executive order and his movement toward uh, a balanced approach. I, I just think the tenor and tone comes across so differently across the aisle that we need to tr try to strike a more subtle balance. Um, I defy anyone in this room to not think about regulation the next time they get on a commuter airliner. Right? How much sleep did that pilot get last night? If you come to my hometown, Chicago, I defy you not to think about regulation when you drink tap water. Well, we have now found chromium, not in the lake, but in the tap water, three times what most people consider to be a healthy level. And if you don't want to think about it now, or then think about it in the morning when you have your eggs. A million cases of salmonella. Uh, so I understand the balance you are talking about because uh, jobs are at stake, but, but you have to recognize lives are at stake. Well, the only thing I have learned in these three meetings is, is reinforced with me, it is a complicated world now. Uh, I think people yearn for a, a day gone by when things weren't so complicated. But, you know, we weren't flying then. We weren't trying to go into space. We didn't have nuclear reactors. Um, and we didn't have the chemical industry, which has many benefits. We didn't have those back then. So we are trying to strike this balance, and it is a process. And it doesn't always work. And we are not always in agreement. I am glad Mr. Kucinich brought out the energy companies that are in favor of the um, global warming, as you call it, uh, regulations that are being discussed. But let me just go back in history, Mr. Chemins, to point out, and I understand we all don't get it right. You recall in 1990 we passed the Clean Air Act amendments under George H. W. Bush, um, and the National Association of Manufacturers said at the time, "quote We will have the dubious when this passes the dubious distinction of moving the United States toward the status of a second-class industrial power by the end of the century." The Business Roundtable commissioned a study on that law and said that we are going to lose at least 200,000 jobs and perhaps as many as 2 million. F four years later, only 2,363 displaced workers, all of them coal miners, applied for aid in the belief their unemployment had been caused by the Act. Looking back on the first 10 years of the Nation's experience with the 1990 program, the agency found a total loss of 4,000 coal miner jobs 
The great majority of the losses, it was concluded, were the result of mechanization and productivity increases, not regulation. So I understand what if they had been right is important, but I at least give some benefit to those attempting to regulate, because we could also have a panel here talking about lives lost on any sort of industry as a result of not regulating appropriately. So I have been on the job one month, so I am hoping that you won't uh, ask me to uh, talk in detail about those 1990 comments. Uh, but what I can say, Congressman, is we are not disputing that regulation can be beneficial. That is not really the issue, as I see it, at hand. I think the issue is making sure that regulations mean, make sense, making sure that they are balanced, and and frankly, making sure that regulating agencies don't overreach. Um, there is a cost of doing business. We've talked about. I've talked about the 18 percent. Some of that cost, we understand, is is going to be necessary. But we should always have a very uh, careful review of every regulation. To uh, any thoughtful analysis, is is going to include all benefits, but also all costs. So. I'm not sitting here saying that we should only look at cost. I, I, I can't imagine any manufacturer would would say that either. But I do think that that we have to. I mean, as members of Congress, you have so many competing demands that you have to deal with. The prism that we need to look through as an association is the prism of jobs and creating jobs for Americans and ensuring that every American who wants a job has the ability to get a job. And the way we do that is by growing our enterprises, by investing capital into new facilities, and providing more opportunities. So that, that's the prism that I'm going to look at things through, and I'm sure that there are prisms that others look through. And, and I want to work with those folks in making sure that we have meaningful regulations that make economic sense and that are not overly burdensome. Toward all those ends, I, I look forward to working with you. Thank, Thank you. you. If I could just make a comment on that. In many cases, it is not the regulation which is so problematic. In some cases, it is. But for us, it is the action of the regulators in interpreting and implementing the regulations. And that is where I think we need the government oversight. I thank the gentleman. Uh, the chair recognizes the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Ross. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Timmons, uh, you know, as I was a kid growing up, I remember that manufacturing was the muscle that drove the American economy, that we were number one in this country producing natural resources, but more importantly, manufacturing here and doing a wonderful job at it. My father, grew, uh, when I grew up, was in a tile manufacturing plant in Florida. It was then home base was in my hometown. It was called Florida Tile. Florida Tile no longer exists in the state of Florida as a manufacturer. And the reason it has is for a myriad of reasons, whether it be regulations, whether it be taxes, whether it be the labor market. But it did have to do with exports, trying to compete globally. Uh, and, and, and I noticed that the Manufacturing Association has indicated that the export, export control regulations have adversely impacted manufacturing in the United States. How would you recommend that we address that? And what could be do, done to, to modernize this so that we could have a balance with our export control regulations? I appreciate your story, Mr. Ross. I have a similar story. My grandfather stood in line for six months during the Great Depression to get a job at a manufacturing facility. He finally was offered that job because the managers there were just sick and tired of seeing him. So his <laughs> persistence paid off. But his, his goal was the goal of manufacturers today, and that was to provide a better quality of life for his family. And uh, he gave me many opportunities. He gave my family many opportunities that so many others didn't. As far as export controls, um, our, our goal is to, and, and this is another area, by the way, where the administration uh, has been working very cooperatively uh, with the manufacturing sector, but there have been some bumps in the road. And it is uh, it's really in terms of implementation, mm -hmm. trying to ensure that there are not multiple uh, lists that have to be um, that have to be reviewed, but one list. That, that there are not multiple processes or multiple uh, permitting processes for the same product being, being, uh, being exported, uh, one, uh, just being able to have one uh, permit that, uh, 
that can carry the day for, for the future. So it's really more of a process question. It, it's not so much the goal. The goal, obviously, is to make sure that we have um, make sure that we have an export policy that makes sense and protects our national security. Um, but on on items that that frankly don't have that much of a uh, national security um, impact. Uh, impact concern. Uh, or that are being produced by other countries around the world, and those countries are freely exporting that product. We really need to to ensure that America that American businesses have the ability to export those products very quickly and without a lot of paperwork. Thank you, uh, Mr. Alfred. In your opening remarks, you hit on something that, that kind of struck a chord with me, and it had to do with gainful employment rule. Or, yeah, gainful employment rules. And when you talk about gainful employment rules, it's interesting coming from the chamber's perspective because that's something that's impacted by the Department of Education, not a traditional regulation that would impact industry, but it also impacts uh, employers who are seeking to find educated, high-skilled laborers right, sir. that cannot get their education because the government prevents them from getting funding to do that because of these gainful employment rules. Could you expand on that a little bit and, and, and yeah. tell me more of how we could change that? Yeah, and, and the funny thing is, not really funny, but the Federal Government took over Sally May student yeah. loans, and here we are. Federal Government is saying we are going to deny your students student loans because the payback record in the last few years is not as good as the students at Harvard or, or Ohio State and what have you. These are inner city kids. They are disadvantaged. They are broke. They are poor. Of course their credit is not going to be as pristine as an upper middle class person would be. You should expect that. There is a risk factor. You know, tack on a little more interest. Cover your risk. But don't deny them the right to finance their education. Many is their last chance. It's their last chance. They can go get a job at one of the members of the National Association of Manufacturers, or they can sell cocaine, yeah. one or the other. They're going to make a living. So why not encourage them to get educated and to live a gainful life? I agree as with opposed you. To that. This rule is mean and cruel. And, and what I really like about it, uh, we put out an ad in, in the uh, Washington Post with Reverend Jesse Jackson, who we and he don't always agree on many things, but <laughs> Reverend Jesse Jackson and Congressman Alcee Hastings. I mean, it's just common sense when you look at this thing. I agree. One, one quick question. I want to ask Mr. Busher of this because I've got six <clears throat> seconds. 1978, you started your business. You have maintained it for 43 years. Would you do it all over again, knowing what the regulatory environment is today? No, sir, I would not. Thank I'm you. sorry. Uh, no, sir, I would not. I Thank discussed you. it earlier. Thank you. The gentleman from Kentucky has been very patient, Mr. Yarman. <laughs> thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. We are very patient in Kentucky. Um, I'd throw out a question which is somewhat rhetorical, but I'd like to hear your answer. There was obviously not a love, lot of love lost for the EPA in this panel. Uh, when did any of you want to see the EPA eliminated? Anyone want to see the Clean Air Act repealed? Okay. Wanted to get that on the record. Shows that no one indicated either one of those. Uh, I need to set the record straight a little bit, at least offer a different perspective on the impact of Waxman Markey. Uh, I come from a district, Mr. Frederick, uh, probably more reliant on coal generated electricity than yours. 92 percent of the power in Kentucky is generated by coal. We take a lot of it out of the ground. And during the debate on Waxman Markey, I also happen to have in my district uh, the the Consumer Products Division of General Electric, a large manufacturing facility, Mr. Timmons, one of your most esteemed members, two Ford manufacturing facilities, and we, are, we also are the global hub of UPS. And during the debate on Waxman Markey, after the, the bill was modified in such a way that the actual permits for emitting carbon dioxide would not be uh, would not cost anything, we would give them out. Uh, I went to the people at Ford, the people at GE, UPS, uh, people at GE were very enthusiastic about the bill. They supported it. The people at Ford were very enthusiastic about it. They supported the bill. And UPS was neutral on the bill. I talked to the University of Louisville, city government, Jefferson County public school system, which is 100,000 students, all of them big users of electricity. Not one of them opposed the bill. They were fine with it. And then I went to our Kentucky Energy Cabinet, asked them what they thought. 
And they said, we think that th this uh, bill, if enacted, will create tens of thousands of new jobs. We asked our local power company what the impact on consumers would be, and they said, we believe that, and this was 2009, of course, we believe that if, um, if a consumer does nothing else, so they don't make any energy uh, efficiencies, they don't insulate, they don't replace their light bulbs, they don't do anything, that the cost will be $15 a month per household in 2019, 10 years later, so $180 a year. So I just wanted to get a different perspective on that, the impact of that legislation, because the reason EPA is acting now is because the Congress failed to act and the Supreme Court mandated that the Clean Air Act be uh, respected. Uh, so I just wanted to get that on the record. Uh, Mr. Frederick, you talked about, and, and Mr. Alfred, you e echoed that, that one of your primary priorities would be tort reform? Correct. What would you like to see us do? Loser pays. That simple. Loser pays. Um, Mr. Alfred, is that doing? Yes. And a good example would be Mississippi. Uh, Governor Haley Barber uh, helped enact some anti-tort Mm -hmm. not anti-tort, but tort reform in Mississippi. And the results has been a big growth in business in Mississippi. Companies are moving right. to Mississippi. And, and that was a state implemented rule. And the federal government has never been involved in tort law in 220 years. Isn't that correct? 230 years. I mean, it's always been a state matter. So you would, you would want to see us in Congress enact uh, a, a national law in that area. Is that what you're saying, Mr. No. Frederick? No. Yes. Okay. No. I'm, and what, I'm, would, what would you tell? What would you do to someone who? Um, because obviously, when um, a big company, whether it's General Electric or Ford, or I'm sure they never do anything wrong, but large companies uh, have access to incredible legal resources and an average citizen. We talked, we heard about uh, babies in cribs. We know that this has happened. Uh, how would they get access to adequate legal help when they actually are damaged severely? Well, they, they, they would continue to get access if the case was uh, valid. But right now there are cases filed that are filed only for the sake of shaking somebody down because it's cheaper to pay than um, to carry it through to trial. Well, it's, it's a shame that Mr. Braley wasn't here, isn't here, because he would have a wonderful conversation on, on that score. Um, but just before I close my time, is, would you ma make any comment, to Mr. Timmons? Do has your organization, Mr. Alfred, has your organization or any of ever advocated um, some alternative approach to dealing with carbon emissions or? You just don't think that's a legitimate need? Well, actually, yes, we have. Um, and I do think that the, the story of manufacturing is, is a great one, because since 1990, energy consumption by manufacturers, by the industrial sector, has only increased 1 percent. That's been achieved through efficiency measures, and, and those measures are some that we support. We believe, um, generally speaking, at the 30,000-foot level, that it makes more sense to incent the private sector to, to conserve and to become more energy efficient. And we think that that is more, a more effective method of achieving our mutual goals of cleaner air and a cleaner environment than, than penalties are. So, so uh, brief answer to your question is yes, we, we do think that there are things that we can do. Yeah, my I thank, the thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize the gentleman from New Hampshire, Mr. Gunta, and would ask him if he would yield to me for 10 seconds. Of course I would. Thank the gentleman. I, I might note for the record that uh, key TAM cases, the seven or 800 people have been sued simply because they failed to remove a patent from their, that was expired off their product that has led to those cases costing millions of dollars. That is a tort case. It is clearly Federal. We do have a big stake in tort reform. Yield back. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And uh, to add to that point, I, I would say two things. First, in my state of New Hampshire, uh, to show the fact that there is a bipartisan willingness to address these liability and tort issues, I would like the committee and uh, these members to know that with 
regard to liability caps, New Hampshire in a bipartisan way passed those liability caps to ensure that we could have productive employers uh, and job creation in the State of New Hampshire. Secondly, I would note that um, the President of the United States in his address, uh, State of the Union address, addressed um, medical, the need for medical uh, liability reform. I would argue that we need to expand that into uh, having thoughtful discussions in, in, a, in a bipartisan way to ensure that uh, employers in our country, small business owners in our country can be more productive. What I am hearing today is that you want to be empowered to create more jobs, to have greater certainty for your business plans, and to pass on maybe in your circumstance, sir, uh, a company that you created uh, from the ground up. And I commend that and I appreciate that. And I think that we ought to inspire that in our nation. Um, <clears throat> I, I want to go back to PLAs. I know that it has uh, been discussed quite a bit, but in New Hampshire we have got a $35 million project that uh, has been held up for over two years because of the PLA issue. Um, it is a Job Corps Center. The Job Corps Center has the ability to do two things, not only employ uh, several hundred people, but it takes up to 500 people a year in New Hampshire who otherwise wouldn't be on the path uh, to get a, a, a standard high school education and give them a skill supported by some of the members of your association who would put in high-tech equipment, in this circumstance some defense-related equipment, who can then be productive members of society. I think that is important. And what is holding that up is the PLA. And I am hopeful that uh, in working with the Department of Labor that we can address that particular issue. Um, so you do have support. Uh, I think the country has support. And my hope is that we look at this in a, in, a, in a more common sense way and try to level the playing field. And I think that is the point that you were trying to make, if you want to just comment on that. Uh, yes, yes, it is. I, I hear a lot of discussion about the, the safety issues and the environment and, and things like that. And I guess in our industry, those, those issues are extremely important to us. I look at a project labor agreement, it does nothing with any of that. All it does is eliminate 85 percent of the workforce from being able to, able to work on those projects. And history has shown it raises the cost of the project anywhere from 18 to 22 percent. And typically that is always taxpayers' money. It is not private funds. It is the taxpayers that are footing this bill for an unreasonable regulation. I think I would add to that municipalities, for example, for every million dollars they bond, uh, it costs them about 100,000 a year. So if you think about a five to ten million dollar project, what that impact would be to a local taxpayer, and that's something that we should always consider. Secondly, relative to OSHA, 1970 OSHA was established for many reasons, but one of their prime objectives was to educate. This is an organization I believe that has moved from educating, which is, in my view, a partnership with employers, um, to nothing more than a gotcha agency. And I don't think anybody here at the table wants to be unsafe. I think all of you have a responsibility to be safe, and I think you take that seriously. What I would like to see um, in the reform, regulatory-wise, OSHA be returned more to an education-based organization who could help both employer and employee for uh, safety in the workplace. Uh, and I would ask uh, Mr. Timmons if you could just comment on that, please. I think you are exactly right that uh, partnership is, is, should be paramount. Uh, if partnerships don't work, then there is the legislative process and, and, if necessary, the regulatory process. But, uh, but when, when businesses and government and regulatory agencies work together for a common goal, which is to make us more competitive, to create jobs, um, uh, everyone ends up succeeding most of the time. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I now recognize the gentlelady from California, Ms. Spears, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for your participation in this hearing. Uh, let me say at the outset, Mr. Chairman, that I want to join with you in scrubbing 
our bureaucracy of outdated regulations. Unfortunately, I, I don't think that we have had that opportunity here to kind of pinpoint what some of those regulations are. If you would like to provide for us in the committee uh, those kinds of outdated regulations that may be 10, 20, 30 years old that have no relevance anymore, um, I'm certain that many of us would like to look at it. I would also like to add, Mr. Chairman, that the hearing title has an inbred bias. How do regulations block private sector job growth? Um, I would have recommended that it would have been preferable to say, how do regulations affect private sector job growth? And, and let me start by um, submitting for the record the series report, which I ask all of you to read, um, which basically suggests that the EPA air pollution rules will generate 1.5 million new jobs and that this group is not some, you know, Hoboken uh, nonprofit. It is a coalition of investors, environmental groups, and other public interest organizations, a group of 95 institutional investors and financial firms from the U.S. and Europe managing nearly $10 trillion in assets. So I would Without objection, so ordered with a reserve from the people of Hoboken. <laughs> okay. Uh, next, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to submit for the record a Wall Street Journal letter to the editor that was signed by the Chairman and President uh, and CEO of PG&E Corp, Calpine, and many others. And in that uh, Wall Street Journal article, they say, contrary to claims that the EPA's agenda will have negative economic consequences, our company's experience complying with air quality regulations demonstrates that regulations can yield important economic benefits, including job creation, while maintaining reliability. That, too, I would like to uh, Without objection, if it is delivered to the desk, it will be included. And finally, I would like to submit to the, um, to the committee and for the record uh, letters from Chrysler, Ford, and General Motors, all of whom um, recommend that um, they embrace the greenhouse gas and fuel economy announcements by the EPA. Again, I think a reflection that um, America's businesses are interested in cleaning the air, making sure it is safe for all Americans, and creating jobs as well. Having said that, um, let me start off by saying eight people in my district died in an explosion in September, fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, a horrific incident that underscored the problem we have in this country relative to regulations, because as more and more is being discovered by the National Transportation Safety Board, and I might add, they better not get defunded or reduced funding in this continuing resolution. What we are finding is that a specific utility gamed the system so that they would not be subject to greater regulation and the kind of assessment necessary to test a particular pipe. So I think that when we look at regulation, we have to look at it in the context is, is it saving lives? Is it protecting Americans? Is it cleaning the air? Is it cleaning the water? And when we can answer those questions, yes, we have to be willing to step up to the plate. The truth of the matter is that Germany has a tougher cap and trade law than was being considered by this Congress. And while our exports have been reduced in the last 10 years, the exports as a per percentage of market share in Germany have increased. So having said all of that, Mr. Chairman, I do have a question, and it is for Mr. Uh, Frederich. You indicated, Mr. Frederich, that with the health care reform legislation, you would actually be reducing the number of jobs in your company. Is that correct? Yeah, we will lower it to uh, whatever is under the limit. All right. So you would go from 62 to 49 intentionally so that you would not be subject to health care reform. Is that correct. correct? That's correct. Now, you do not offer health insurance to your employees now, I gather. Yes, we do. And what do you offer? We offer a high deductible HSA. So that's a, a, a a savings account. So Health they, savings account. So yeah. they get how many thousands of dollars a year? What do you mean they get? What, don't you, you offer, do you put money into their health savings account? No. Or, so, you don't, so you really don't have a, you don't provide any money from the company in terms of making sure that your employees are insured? Sure we do. Our, our, our monthly premium for uh, family coverage is $1,000 and we pay 70 percent of it. So you pay 70 percent 
of the premium. Of the premium. So is it, a, ca is it a catastrophic policy? What, I'm trying to understand. No, no. It's actually a very good policy because uh, for, for normal things like uh, uh, annual checkups or mammograms or colonoscopies, it pays 100 percent with no deductible at all. But what it, what it eliminates is people going to the emergency room because they have a cold, uh, which, is, which is, you know, just a very expensive way. What it does uh, try and do is put some uh, consumer, consumerism into purchasing medical uh, services. And, and I feel that is the problem with the system right now. It is a third party payer system where people, they don't even ask what it costs. It, when, the last time you went to the doctor, did you ask how much does this cost? Well, I actually the, the gentlelady's time has expired. Oh. <laughs> thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. Uh, the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Farenthold. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I, I wanted to follow up on a on a couple of things that I uh, I heard earlier, and I'm just. I was a small business owner before I uh, came to Congress. I think the fourth employee I hired was an employee to help me deal with paperwork, and I was in a service industry that isn't that highly regulated. So it starts as simple as filling out the forms for your first employee and meeting your tax return. So I, I understand it gets in the way of doing uh, what you're passionate about, building what you want to build or serving the people you want to serve. Uh, we have heard several people say that well, regulations actually, uh, actually create jobs. I, I, I ponder how many of those are bureaucrats and lawyers or how many of those just add to the cost of doing business. But my, my real questions were, uh, Mr. Timmons, I think you said it is 18 percent more expensive to open a factory in the United States. Is, is that what your accurate number? To do business in the United States. Right, so, 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 yes. Would your members does it have to be exactly equal, or are your no, members willing to pay a slightly higher cost to to do business in the United States of America? Absolutely. Um, the question really is, where is you know where is that sweet spot? I can't answer that. Okay. Every every company has to make that that decision on their own. But what we do know is that we've lost manufacturing jobs. It wasn't just during this last recession. It's been over the course of the last 12, 14 years. And what we are seeing is manufacturers looking at other industrialized nations and other uh, emerging economies and saying it makes more sense economically to do And so as you look there. at, for instance, environmental regulations, uh, That's that one. You, you, you go over to Mexico, China, wherever you go, that don't have the same regulations, and it gets into the same air we breathe anyway. Or they have the same outcome, and, uh, uh, but, but their regulations are perhaps um, uh, administered in a different way and less costly uh, to administer. And I do want to point out, and I have said this several times, but that 18 percent number does not include the cost of labor. Because right. We believe that it makes sense to pay, to pay employees more in the United States because we believe in a higher standard of living here. And, and Mr. Nassif, I, I think you hit on something that uh, I, I wanted to talk a little bit more about, too. Uh, and I would appreciate the rest of the panel's input on this. When you go, you look at some companies in the travel and entertainment industry, their employees are basically threatened with getting fired if they say no to a customer. When you are dealing with a Federal agency, do you, do you find that the attitude is, how can, we are from the government, we are here to help you, how can we find a way for you to come into compliance with these regulations, or it is just you are out of compliance with this regulation, uh, you are shut down? And whoever wants to take that. Well, each, each regulatory agency handles it differently. As I say, when we are dealing with the Department of Agriculture, we have a very close relationship and they have a very strong understanding of what our needs are. And so there is always a nice, honest dialogue. When we are dealing with agencies like the Department of Labor, there is no such thing as we are your friend, we are here to help you. We are here to regulate you, we are here to enforce things, and we are here to punish you if you make even tactical violations. That's one of my best bar jokes. You know, where are you from? I'm from Washington, D.C., and I've come to help you. It's guaranteed laughter there. But we are for regulations, good regulations. We're not against regulations. We are against onerous, nonsensical, punitive regulations that do not end up in a solution manner. And if we were to evaluate all our regulations, pair out the bad regulations, keep the good regulations, we would be a better country, and we would be without 70 percent of the regulations. 
Congressman, the uh, example I cited about the uh, lead paint ruling by the EPA, uh, we had acquired all the necessary permits for that particular project, state permits, local permits, everything required what was on site in place, and the actual field inspector walked on the job site and said, I think this falls underneath the lead RRP rule and it needs to be investigated. At that point, we had no comeback to an OSHA inspector to say, no, we don't think so. Uh, all the permits, everything is in place. He saw the paperwork. He signed the paperwork, but he also stopped the job. Uh, the general contractor, as I explained, had to, had to spend approximately $10,000 in suits and gear and training, stop the job, slow the job down, down the road, and we find out that the OSHA inspector was wrong. Well, thank you very much. It is almost lunchtime, so I will yield back the short amount of time I have left. All of us, thank you. We now recognize the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Tierney, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, this is all very interesting. Uh, I think that what we established early on is everybody here believes in a balanced economy. We think that uh, there has to be capitalism, but it has to have some regulation. We want the regulation to be fair. We want it to be about necessary things. We want it to be balanced. So we have just spent a couple hours, we we'll probably spent a couple more beating that dead horse uh, around and around. But to the extent that we are all here to talk uh, about hyperbole, you know, these over-the-top allegations that regulations are just in and of themselves bad or whatever, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. You know, we had an economic collapse in 2007. Uh, it was right on the heels of probably what is an, an era known mostly for a success of deregulation. All right, so that didn't work very well, and that particularly with respect to the financial services of Wall Street, but it was broader than that. And now here we are looking at business in the third quarter of 2010. The United States corporate profits were $1.66 trillion, trillion dollars, up 60 percent. So if we are talking about, oh, my God, overregulation in the last two years, somebody is going to have to explain to me how, in spite of all that onerous regulation and being the dearth of jobs and corporate success, uh, they managed to make a 60 percent increase in $1.66 trillion. So I think what we want to do is weed out the hyperbole, you know, get down to it. If we want to have hearings on specific regulations that we think are owners are bad, let's have the hearings. I mean, I come from a community that can tell you a story after story about the fishing regulations from NOAA. So I'm not opposed at all to looking at those regulations. And we have passed, you know, got regula regulations and laws that we propose to deal with what we think was excessive enforcement excessive application and bad regulations. So that is what this committee ought to be about, not this general hyperbole about, you know, all regulations and somebody supposedly likes regulations and somebody doesn't. Uh, it's, it amounts to a bunch of nonsense. Uh, but just to make a point on some of this, the talking points that we get from some industries uh, on that, an area that I happen to know something about uh, on that, and I, and I don't want to seem like, Mr. Alfred, I'm coming at you, uh, but you would allow us and the most aggressive about this, and I, I want to maybe give you some information that apparently you don't have, because it seems to me you are getting the private college talking points uh, back to us. You made a point about student loans, you know, now being uh, taken away from uh, Sally May and groups like that. We save $60 billion in taxpayer money, $60 billion. And what do we do with it? Besides paying down some on the debt, which is a problem that we all have, uh, we increase Pell Grants for students who needed to have access to college. We reduce the interest rates on student loans for students that need to be able to get through school. Uh, we had an income-based repayment program so that now students can get out of school and have a set amount of money they pay to pay down their loans, so they are knowing that it won't be a barrier to entry and that it can be a way for them to take a job that they want when they get out and to stay going on that. And we put money into community colleges so they could cooperate with industry and labor and the Workforce Investment Board's public sector to make sure people have the skills and education ready to take jobs. Maybe we should have a hearing about that and go forward. But you talked also, Mr. Alfred, about the student loan default regulations and private uh, for-profits. So let me tell you a little bit of information we have had on hearings in the Education Committee and the information that comes from that. It is set up to protect students from taking on unsustainable debt. It is a debt that they can't repay. It is to protect the taxpayers from high loan default rates. The Higher Education Act specifically put in a provision, and we wrote it so we know, career education programs that receive Federal aid must prepare students for a gainful employment in a recognized occupation. Now, regulation doesn't just target the for-profits. It applies to all of the institutions. It doesn't affect students' ability to get a loan. It talks about the universities and the colleges. Students, they are held accountable for life. If they get a loan to an institution that doesn't provide them with the education or skills to get a job, 
They can't shake it. It affects whether they can buy a house. It affects whether or not uh, they ever have to go into bankruptcy, which is very difficult for them. It affects every decision they make, their credit rating and so on uh, down the line. Colleges, however, aren't generally held accountable at all. So this regulation doesn't even target the whole college. It just targets those programs within the college that have a very low repayment rate and a very high debt burden to those students. The college eligibility for student aid is tied to a specific credit default rate. You might want to know that the cohort default rate for for-profits is the highest. Now, right? It is double the national average. It is 25 percent of the students that go to those institutions default on that. Private non-for-profits is 7.6 percent, and the public is only 10.8 percent. For-profits enroll one out of every 10 students, but they get one out of every four Federal aid dollars. So this is all about protecting the taxpayers' money and protecting those students who end up with a big debt and no job in a place that they can get it on that. Now, in 2007, 92 percent of the undergraduates and the for-profits borrowed. The, the gentleman's time has expired. Is there a question? No, there is not a question. There is an educational process going on here since we were talking about education and maybe a suggestion to the chairman that instead of all this hyperbole, we talk about specific regulations that might be a problem that we can all agree on ought to be addressed. But I am happy to yield back. I thank the gentleman. We will now recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania who for 57 years he and his family have been small business people. I think that comes out to be since five years old. He has been a small businessman uh, for five minutes. Mr. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And first of all, I want to thank all the panel for being here. And it is interesting to get a lesson from people that are running a business that is $1.5 trillion in the red each year, year after year. And I am sure you are going to take that home and really learn from that. Uh, but for people that really do have the skin in the game and people who do survive by doing it on both knees and looking into the abyss, I have done it myself and I know how close we come each day to not having our businesses anymore. So would you please, if you could, just take a few minutes, because the true trick is not pulling a rabbit out of the hat, it is putting the rabbit in the hat to begin with. And I think that this body needs to understand that where small business comes from, where business comes from, is not from government, it is from the private sector. Mr. Boucher, I know what you are going through. I go through the same thing. My business is down over 35 percent. Mr. Friedrich, I understand what it is like to look into the abyss. I have done it many times myself. The magic hours, the bewitching hours, which most members of Congress have never had a face because they don't sign the front of these checks, is between 2 and 4 in the morning when your body may be fatigued, but your mind won't let you sleep. So if you could, just walk us through some of the things that you have had to do to keep your businesses open, keep jobs alive for people in your community, and what you have to do. So each, if you could just take a few minutes and maybe educate us on what we need to hear and what the country has to hear from the people who truly do lead this country, and that is the small business people. Uh, I guess one of my largest experiences last year was an order for my company to bid public work and continue to receive bonding because of the previous year being extremely poor. Uh, I had to financially put additional six-figure dollars into the business so I could secure bonding, which, again, allowed us to bid those jobs but prevented us from replacing trucks, from replacing bending equipment, things like that that we should have to be more efficient and, and be on top of our game. Uh, it has just been a real tough battle to uh, sur survive the problems. And, and the regulations being slapped on us, uh, in all honesty, I respect what is being said, and I am not anti-safety or anti-anything like that. Uh, I, I just think it needs to be done as a team and, and not as someone telling you, here is what you are going to do and, and here is what you have to do, and, and there is no explanation for reasons why. Well, you will laugh when you hear this, but uh, one of the things that I have done is I uh, built a, well, I call it the penthouse in our plant. And I, I live 70 miles from our facility. Our facility is in uh, Manitowoc, and I live in Fond du Lac. So uh, I leave on Monday morning from home, and I stay in our plant every night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday night, and I go home on Fridays. And I, I used to stay in, a, uh, in the fashionable Comfort Inn, uh, but that is $70 a night, and that adds up. So now I've, uh, I'm living large. I've got a bed. I've got a recliner. I have a 36-inch uh, flat-screen TV, and I sleep in the plant with my dog. Uh, monetarily, uh, the hardest uh, thing for any business is uh, cash flow. If when you run out of cash flow, you're dead. You you can't go anywhere. And I would hear uh, the um, 
uh, talking about the recovery, we need to get the banks to lend money so, so uh, uh, companies can make payroll and hire people. If you have to borrow money to make your payroll, you're dead, usually. Maybe there are rare occasions, but you're dead. Uh, so there have been times when, when I have had, and we, when we first started, we, you know, I, I said we closed our business one month after 9-11 and we went into a recession and, and we almost went out of business. And we would have had we not been with a, um, a privately held bank who, who knew us. He knew us as people and we weren't going to run away from it. And we, we never missed an interest payment or a principal payment, but we lost money. Uh, and there are many times when, when, we, when I would have to write uh, a check on my uh, personal savings uh, to cover payroll. I had to do it. Or I'd have to pay a supplier, because there are some suppliers, you guys don't know this, but there are some suppliers which can kill you and others which you can push off. We always push off, uh, um, oh, like uh, attorneys and accountants and, <laughs> and those guys. <laughs> Because really, they're not going to get anything from us anyway unless we stay in business. But uh, raw material suppliers, no, can't do it. Uh, people who provide, uh, you, know, uh, you, you have to pay your taxes, you have to pay all your employment taxes. Well, you, do, you don't do that, you, you, you go to jail. And, and we can't print any money. I mean, uh, like, like you guys, we can't turn on the press. Not, and print not, some not money. all you guys, okay. <laughs> okay. Like I'm, some with, of you. I'm with you. <laughs> anyway, so it's, uh, and somebody asked a question, uh, would you, do it all over again. You said, no, I would. I love it. I absolutely love it. It's like a, uh, a great rush every day. It's full of, full of uh, frustration, but I love it. And I wouldn't do anything else. Well, God bless you for what you're doing. I understand. I got 110 people that rely on me to make sure that every two weeks they can cash a check. So I'm with you. Good. I thank the gentleman. We now recognize the very affable, happy gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thanks for uh, conducting this hearing. You know, I think it's important that uh, our committee's work be based on fact rather than rhetoric. Uh, recently, there have been many statements asserting that overregulation has resulted in massive job losses, but in fact, it was deficient and sometimes non-existent regulation of the financial sector that resulted in the financial collapse and loss of more than 8 million jobs. Uh, Alan Greenspan testified before this committee in 2008 about regulation. Here's what he said, quote, I made a mistake in presuming that the self-interest of organizations, specifically banks and others, was such that they were best capable of protecting their own shareholders and their equity in their firms, end of quote. Uh, that's why it's so important that Congress passed the Wall Street Reform Bill last year to increase transparency and accountability. Uh, now, a lot of the letters that the committee received from major companies criticized the Wall Street Reform Bill, but the provisions they criticized had little to do uh, with jobs. And let me give you a few examples. The companies complained about having this, to disclose CEO compensation. They complained about having to return bonuses when corporate earnings were inflated. Uh, and they complained about requiring all companies to disclose payments to foreign governments. Uh, this is uh, uh, a panel-wide question. You know, these provisions are all about uh, disclosure and transparency. So let's start with Mr. Busher. Uh, do you think disclosing CEO compensation prevents a company from creating jobs? I'm not sure, sir, it would prevent a company from creating jobs. I assume you're talking public companies, not private companies? And public companies. Sure. Public companies. Uh, sure. As a stockholder of public companies, I think I have that right to have that disclosure, and I wouldn't be objectionable to it, and I can't see what harm it would do. Okay. What about you, Mr. Frederick? Does, uh, disclosing CEO compensation. Uh, I, I think it's no one's business. Uh, it's already disclosed uh, to the Internal Revenue Service. 
And uh, what I do with my company, since I take 100 percent of the risk, is my business, not anybody else's. And, and you made one point, which I must, uh, must ask you, about uh, returning overstated uh, bonuses related to overstated earnings. Yeah. Fannie Mae had that situation. Overstated earnings, bonuses were paid. Were they returned? Yeah, well, they were, well, they were card, weren't they? They were not returned. They were card, weren't they? How about you, Mr. Alpert? I have no problems with it, sir. I think it's rather snoopy, but I have no problems with it. Okay. How about you, Mr. Nassau? Our, our business is, as an association, we're not for profit, but we run several for profit corporations. I believe that people who are involved in public corporations should disclose all compensation. Okay. People in government should disclose all compensation. People who are taking federal funds based upon needs may need to disclose that same compensation because they need to justify the need for the loan. Thank you for your response. Mr. Timmons? Uh, yes, Mr. Clay. All the issues that you brought up are, are not ones that were addressed in our letter. And you also talked about the uh, financial services reform legislation. We did yeah. not, uh, that's not our, obviously that's not our, uh, uh, the industry that we uh, represent. So we did not oppose or support that legislation. Um, I think that, uh, I think arguments can be made on both sides of the question on, on, the, on the question that you asked specifically. And I, um, uh, one thing that I think is very important is uh, that, that uh, any regulatory um, requirements not create a situation that uh, could be where a political argument could be made or a populist argument can be made against a company and take the company off of its uh, uh, off of its mission to create the products that they're trying to create. And sometimes I think that that type of information can cause that. And I Ms. Ms. Timmons, since we're on the subject of job creation, uh, how does, what are your thoughts in NAMS on the outsourcing of American jobs? Um, one of the points that I made earlier, sir, was that it's 18 percent more expensive to do business in the United States when you don't factor in the cost of labor. Uh, but you're looking at the cost of regulation, you're looking at the cost of energy in this country, and you're looking at tort costs. And what we see is that many companies are having to make very painful decisions to locate elsewhere, not only to be closer to their customer base, but to be able to uh, uh, to compete and succeed in, in a very competitive international marketplace. Uh, we want jobs to be created here in this country. That's why we exist. We want to see manufacturing flourish in the United States, and we want it to uh, continue to grow and to be a vital part of economic growth and job creation here. And, and that's why you fought so hard in closing tax incentives to stop outsourcing? Your, your association has fought hard to stop tax incentives. To, to stop what? For outsourcing. For outsourcing jobs. Speci what specific piece of legislation are you talking about? Well, as, uh, last year you, you opposed the payroll tax holiday. You, and then. Uh, I, I'm not sure that's. Yes, you did. Correct, sir, but I'll be happy fought, to talk you to you. You fought closing time. tax incentives to stop outsourcing of American jobs. Uh, we may have some disagreements on exactly <laughs> what okay, which, well, uh, issue you're talking about. But I'd be happy to talk to you afterwards. Yeah, I'll, I'll share it with you. Thank you. Thank you. Would that. the gentleman yield? Uh, when the gentleman's question is on pay compensation, uh, I have the, the actual report. And are you speaking to the two letters that came in from America Express and, round, and the Business Roundtable out of over 300 letters that referred to the golden parachute compensation and the pay ratio in the Dodd-Frank bill? Are those the items you were yeah. referring to? Yeah. Okay, so it is two out of 300 and some letters, 2,000 pages. There okay. okay. I, I thank the gentleman. Uh, we now recognize the gentleman from Mich Michigan, Mr. Wahlberg. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you to the, uh, the panelists for being here. T and I uh, appreciate your, your candidness, appreciate your willingness to, uh, to come and deal with uh, these issues of concern. Uh, Mr. Timmons, uh, I, I thank you for your testimony. Um, it's clear that we both share some key concerns over how OSHA uh, is carrying out its regulatory responsibilities. 
and uh, how it can uh, um, be dealt with, uh, particularly as, uh, as subcommittee chair for workforce protections on the Education and Workforce Committee. Um, I am interested in your comments. I will be host, hosting a, or conducting a, a hearing next week uh, investigating OSHA's particular regulatory agenda and its impact on job creation. So I appreciate in your testimony uh, you pointing out how a single company could be burdened with a $1 billion price tag for compliance costs uh, with the proposed noise regulation. Uh, could you uh, describe in more detail, uh, if possible, what administrative or engineering controls your members would have to create in order to comply with that noise proposal? I think each company looks at, uh, looks at what they would have to do, so I can't say specifically. Uh, but what I can say is that, uh, and I was in, in one of our companies just about a month ago, and they were not aware of this particular regulation uh, that, that was being considered. And they have noise abatement procedures, the little foam earplugs you've probably seen. Mm -hmm. um, and they actually have a medical uh, facility on campus to ensure that, uh, for, for many reasons, but one of the things that that facility does is to make sure that those uh, devices are working appropriately. Um, I don't know what the cost of those are, but they're probably less than a quarter a day per worker. Um, and uh, when I asked that particular company what they would have to do to get their noise level down to about 90 decibels, which is, I believe, what the regulation was calling for, that's also about the sound of a flute being played over a prolonged period of time, um, uh, they nearly hit the floor when, when they started thinking about it and what they would have to do and whether technology even existed to be able to do that. So uh, it was a <laughs> it was a um, it was a stark um, it was a stark realization on their part that that uh, the investment they would have to make would be uh, very severe would would make them less competitive and potentially cost jobs. But I can try to get you some specific uh, information on on the components and what those components would be um, for representative manufacturing facilities. I'd appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Mr. Frederick, uh, thank you for your testimony and thank you for using your dime to, to come on out here. We appreciate it. You're welcome. Um, I assume that your employee-led compliance efforts uh, are effective in preventing injuries and illnesses. Could you expand on the steps you take to ensure employee, employee safety? Yeah, we have a, um, a safety committee and it's, um, I think, eight or ten people from all over our plant. We have some management people, people who run machines, supervisors. And what we do every month is we walk around the plant, it's 65,000 square feet, and we look for problems. We look for uh, areas that, that uh, could cause an, cause an injury. And then we uh, uh, document those, and then we give any uh, uh, changes or fixes that are required to our maintenance people, and then that's their first priority to fix that. In addition to that, um, once a quarter, our uh, our workers' comp carrier uh, comes into our, our plant. Somebody uh, mentioned uh, OSHA being uh, more of an educator. Well, the, the workers' comp carriers do the same thing. I mean, they are an educator, and it's always good to have uh, somebody else look at your plant because they see things that you overlook. It's, it, it always happens. And you do this voluntarily, what you're telling us. Oh, absolutely, yeah. But the last thing we want to do is have, have somebody hurt. I mean, it's the last, it's just, the worst thing that happened to us was we had one fellow uh, cut two fingers off, and he did it by wrapping a rubber band around a safety switch on a press. And so he, he circumvented the safety mechanism, and he cut his fingers off. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I mean, that, that, that was bad, but it, I don't know what you do to protect yourself against something like that. But it's a, uh, you know, it's a big cost for us, and, and, and we have a, a strong, strong incentive to reduce that, uh, that cost, because it, it, it literally costs more than our health insurance, and we have the uh, ability to manage it, and that's the key. We can manage it, and we can reduce our rating. Uh, you're familiar with the, um, the mod ratings for uh, manufacturers. Our, our mod rating is 0.93. 
And we'd like to, if we can get that down to 0.7 or 0.6, then our premium is down and, and um, we save money. And we can only do that by having a safe. Do product. you pay out incentives? Do you pay out incentives for we that? We do, absolutely. We pay out, if we don't have a, uh, a work related injury, a lost time injury, we pay uh, $15 a month cash to everybody. Uh, if we do have a work related injury, it kind of starts over. You start at zero, then it goes to five, then 10, and then 15. Thank you, and thanks for the extended time. I thank the gentleman, the very patient gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Langford, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since it is uh, lunchtime, let me start by talking about food and fiber. Can we do that? And uh, so let's talk about an agriculture question. Mr. Nassif, thank you for being here, and for all of you, thank you for being here. W what would you guess, and it is just going to be a ballpark guess, based on the regulations that are coming down and that have been coming down onto the agricultural industry, uh, on the effect it would have on the cost of food? and also the number of jobs that are affected based on the regulations that have happened. And you can pick any time period, last 10 years, 5 years, whatever it may be. Well, <clears throat> clearly the, uh, <clears throat> the cost of adhering to the regulations limits the amount of capital that is available for investment in technology, right. in conservation, in the environment, and in adding more jobs to the workforce. Because agriculture is so diverse, there is no way to, to say what it is for agriculture. I represent the fresh produce people. We grow fresh fruits, vegetables, and tree nuts like almonds and mm -hmm. walnuts. And, uh, and each of those industries is different. We have about 300 different commodities that we represent. Each commodity is different. Right. And the effect on regulations and the profitability is different depending on what growing region you are from and what the climate is during that particular growing region. But I think the thing people have to understand is, that for the, for the growers, the margin of profit may be 2 percent. So there is no, there's not a lot of room for that. And as I stated earlier, we don't set prices. So the more costs we have added, the less likely we are going to be competitive, right. which means that the retailers and the food service companies are less likely to buy our products. So would you say that uh, regulatory environment is increasing the number of jobs in agriculture or decreasing the number of jobs in agriculture? Only administrative jobs. Okay. So if you had the choice of hiring another compliance officer or hiring another person to actually handle product, which would you choose? Well, we would much rather have, handle people to handle product, but okay. sometimes we are forced to do the, the other. Right. Jobs are being created, but they are compliance officers basically fulfilling regulatory requirements is what you are saying on that? Yes. Big increase in employment in that sector. Okay. J just as a random question for everybody, if, if you had to right now make a decision based on the regulatory environment to hire a person or to put a robot in that place to do it, uh, it is an interesting thought to think, if you could just avoid all the regulations, not have to deal with all the regulations, I am just going to put a robot in that spot to do that same job. Would there be a tendency among anyone to say, it is almost safer to put a robot there than it is a person, because then I wouldn't have all the OSHA requirements, all the additional stuff that is added to it as well? I think there is certainly a move toward increased technology because of the problems created uh, by the regulatory burdens in, in hiring more people. So it is a disincentive. Okay. to hire those people and an incentive to do more technology and reduce Just do it and mechanize so I don't have to deal with all the regulations. Yes. Where are you going to say something as well, Mr. Fred, or someone else? Uh, we are installing a robot right now. <laughs> okay. A robot. And that is somewhat just to avoid all the regulatory requirements that are there. Obviously, you have got a one-time purchase for that person. You will have to deal with all the, the long-term costs and things with that, or is there some other reason for that? Productivity. Okay. It is it's productivity. Okay. Uh, but, you know, if we didn't have the robot, we would have to have two people on one press, so now we have one. But, you know, we, we don't get rid of that person. We hopefully have, have another job for him. Right. Well, productivity so. gives you the ability to enhance your operations elsewhere and, and hopefully hire more people. Hopefully so. Let, let, me, let me ask something of you. Um, the, the predictability of the regulations that are coming. Uh, I, I assume you don't wake up every morning and read the newspaper and then go read the government website to find out what new regulations are coming on board. Uh, you have trade agencies and such that are helping you take care of that. Is there a predictable schedule that you can look at and say, I know every six months or every year I'm going to get some new list, or do they seem to come all the time? And anyone can respond to that. With this administration, it, it is lightning speed and always a surprising group, a mass of new regulation. It's, it's, it's wild. It's a runaway freight train. Would it help you to have some sort of predictability to say new regulations come out at a certain moment and that way you are not having to worry about every day the rules are changing on me or the rumor the rules are changing? That, that would be very helpful, sir. Okay. For anyone else, would that be helpful to you, to have some sort of predictability in that? 
It would be tremendously helpful. And in our industry, in the construction industry, we are fighting the same issues. There are rules and regulations coming out every day that you hope you are within the guidelines of, but uh, there, there is no way you can practically keep up with what is happening at, at the speed it is happening right now. Okay. And you are dealing with both State regulations, I assume, and also Federal regulations. Do you deal with Federal regulations that the State and the Federal are in, are in conflict or they are trying to regulate the same thing or the same practice? Absolutely. Anyone else dealing with that as well? Yes, we are. Okay. Sure, you always deal with that. On, on your question of certainty, um, let's look at the EPA regulations that uh, uh, were set five years ago, um, or two years ago, pardon me, and they were supposed to uh, be in effect for a number of years, and the agency decided to reopen those regulations. I think that's another thing to look at. If a regulation is set, it needs to be set because from the manufacturing sector, we try to to align our businesses with the regulatory uh, regime that we know. Now, if we are if we're trying to look at every regulation and see what makes sense from a competitiveness standpoint and we are going to increase competitiveness, then that makes sense. But if it is just simply to, to increase the, uh, the regulatory threshold, that really doesn't make sense and it harms our ability to, to respond appropriately to the regulatory regime. Terrific. Thank you. When I became President of Western Growers, one of the things I vowed to do was to be more proactive and not so reactive, because that is what agriculture had been. I can tell you I failed at that miserably, because there is so much to have to react to, so many new rules and regulations constantly from across the board, state, federal, local regulations, that it is impossible to be as proactive as is necessary to achieve the really economic goals uh, of an association. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you very much, gentlemen. I, I thank the gentleman. Now recognize the ranking member. I want to thank the, the chairman uh, for yielding. Mr. Chairman, I just want, would like to correct the record uh, on an important issue. Earlier in the hearing, we heard about a letter uh, from uh, Stanley Goose Stewart, a coal miner injured in the Upper Branch Mine in West Virginia. His letter was very compelling, and he argued uh, in favor of greater regulation of coal mining companies. The chairman, uh, you uh, made a statement, and I want to cl just clarify it. And, um, you said that mine safety was not raised in any of the responses the committee received. In support of this statement, you entered into the record the appendix of the report your staff prepared uh, for today's hearing. Mr. Chairman, the fact is that one of the witnesses here today, the Makatis Center, did criticize the proposed mining regulation in its uh, submission to the committee. In addition, the appendix you entered into the record states on page 82 that the Business Roundtable also raised concerns with uh, rules and that require mining companies to disclose information about mine safety and health standards. So Mr. Stewart's letter was right on point. And just the other, uh, just for clarification's sake, uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, Henry, you were talking to uh, uh, Congressman Lacey Clay, uh, and you mentioned that there were two of the 300 responses uh, from the Business Roundtable that represents uh, but we want to keep in mind that they represent more than, and I think this was in compensation, uh, with regard to compensation, uh, executive compensation. Uh, they represent 13 million employees, six, $6 trillion in annual revenue, and member companies comprise nearly one third of the total value of the United States stock market. And so um, just wanted, just for clarification's sake. I thank the and gentleman. I appreciate it. And, and I'll be brief in my, my closing here. Uh, uh, Mercatus we will hear from later, the Business Roundtable. Uh, I guess maybe I missed the fact that that was the group the President asked for, uh, for input from. But having said that, uh, just briefly, Mr. Frederick, uh, Frederick uh, are you ISO 9001, 9002? Do you supply, subscribe to that? Yeah, we were first certified in uh, 2003 and then recertified in nine, 2009. And that allows you to sell in Europe without the Europeans inspecting you because a voluntary standard of quality and so on, you're, you're certified basically so that they, they don't come and, and secondarily inspect you the way so often other agencies here in the U.S. do. Is the, that correct? The, uh, the, uh, uh, the toughest inspections we have are from uh, customers. Customers will send in their quality people and uh, they'll give us a, a really good exam. Uh, but then we also have internal audits, and then we have uh, the external uh, quality audit. Yes. And Mr. Timmons, uh, sort of uh, right in the mainstream of NAM, the Boiler MACT, M A C T, isn't it true that the EPA, finding that it was an unachievable goal, asked for additional time, went to the court basically because of their failed 
regulatory policy. They made it a rule, then went to the Federal Court trying to delay it, and eventually have been told, no, essentially fix your own problem. We are not going to delay implementation of a bad law that currently cannot be uh, can't be achieved, is my understanding. Isn't that true? That is correct. Okay. So uh, perhaps how do regulations block private je sector job creation may not be the best, uh, but it certainly seems that there is one or more uh, that are real impediments to job creation in each of your industries. I want to thank all of you for being here today. We have a second panel that is going to start probably at quarter to one. Uh, I would keep you all here for round after round. I suspect that the specifics that you have been able to give here today could be enhanced many times fold. Uh, none of it was hyperbole. All of it was, in fact, what I thought were good responses to real questions when they were given. And for the, uh, the small businesses that uh, came here on their own dime and make sacrifices every day to make sure their employees are safe, have health care, and they get paychecks before you do. Thank you again. We stand in recess until 1, 1245. Six, six, issued in 1993 by President Bill Clinton. The statement concludes that the regulatory system falls short of these goals. That is truer today than it was 18 years ago. From the lighting in their homes to the volume of their television sets to the cars they buy, Americans today are facing an unprecedented tide of red tape in their lives, red tape that is increasing prices, reducing innovation, and destroying jobs. Last fiscal year, the number and cost of new regulations imposed by, the federal, by federal agencies reached unprecedented levels. Based upon reports from the Government Accountability Office, in fiscal year 2010 alone, some 43 major new rules increasing regulatory burdens were issued by federal agencies. That is higher than any other year on record. The total annual cost for these rules, based on estimates by the regulators themselves, tops $26.5 billion the highest level since at least 1981, the earliest date for which records are available. Many more are on the way. The costs imposed by these rules vary as much as the regulations themselves. One cost, perhaps surprisingly to many, is in decreased safety. It can be in terms of decreased safety. Several members uh, uh, mentioned uh, safety concerns, as they should, uh, uh, in the discussion during the first panel. And certainly many, many regulations are essential to preserving safety. But we shouldn't forget that, that safety can also be decreased by regulations. It can be a cost. That points specifically to cafe rules, fuel economy rules that, that, that have forced Americans into smaller, less safe vehicles, causing many deaths, and even airline safety, uh, where, where specifically such rules as, as child safety seats have, have forced, induced Americans to drive rather than fly, moving them to a less safe mode of transportation. Our specific subject here today is the cost in terms of jobs. Now, you have heard from many other witnesses how many jobs may be destroyed or not created because of particular regulations. But no businessman needs an academic study to know how regulations affect their bottom line and can stop them from hiring new workers. A couple of points I want to stress, though. First, economic studies can only capture effects on existing industries, or at least predictable in industries and technologies. The dogs that don't bark are not counted. New technologies that are stunted, new products that are never brought to market, and ideas that never are acted upon don't make it into the statistics, yet these are real costs of regulation. Also, I want to point out that regulations can create jobs as well as eliminate them, but this is not always a good thing. For instance, a new regulation can, and in fact usually does, create more demand for lawyers, lobbyists, and even regulators themselves. This may increase the job roles, but, but it is not a, an increase in wealth or prosperity for society. For the same reason, policymakers should be wary of claims about new rules creating green jobs. Green jobs can be productive, can increase wealth in society, but not if those jobs are based on artificial mandates or restrictions that are not otherwise justified. If, if uh, they are justified only in terms of creating the job, they add nothing to prosperity. So that, that, that is something for policymakers to watch out for. The bottom line, it is critical that policymakers increase scrutiny of new and existing rules to ensure that each is necessary and that costs are minimized. 
President Obama has recognized this, uh, uh, and, and it's taking a welcome first step towards reform by, by announcing um, uh, that he, his administration would look harder at new rules, at, at, at existing rules uh, uh, that are already in the books. I'm a little bit concerned, however, that that review is not stringent enough. In fact, if you look at the language of the executive order issued by the President, it only asked agencies to come up with a preliminary plan for regulations to review rather than to come up with the, uh, uh, actions directly. Uh, it, it is a very small first step. And the fact that it, it does not include uh, independent agencies, that some of the, which are some of the primary producers of new regulations and uh, regulations on the books, is a matter of concern and, and, a, and a, a loophole in, in this review. Uh, let me just say to, to, to follow up, um, uh, uh, I'm encouraged by the actions of this committee and the work in focusing attention on this important problem and in, in identifying and asking for in information from businesses who are affected by regulation and by the public in, in getting information. Uh, I, lastly, just um, I, I have several legislative, propo legislative proposals I, I think the committee should look at. Let me just list them. I think Congress should be required to approve all new rules in order to increase accountability. I think that there should be a regulatory impact statement prepared by a new Congressional Regulation Office to allow Congress to provide more information, get more information about rules. And lastly, there should be a sunset period for, for all rules after, uh, say, five or six years in order to ensure that they are doing their job and that bad rules uh, are taken off the books. Uh, with that, uh, again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to, talk, to testify today. I thank the gentleman. Mr. Shapiro. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Regulatory critics contend the cost of regulation has kept the U.S. business community from participating more fully in our nation's economic recovery. Upon examination, however, it turns out that a focus on regulatory costs is a flawed way to examine the usefulness and necessity of government regulation or to determine whether or not regulatory costs are hindering the nation's economic recovery. The focus on regulatory costs is misguided for four reasons. First, as we heard discussed in the last panel this morning, the cost of regulation in isolation proves nothing because it ignores the benefits that regulation brings to the public and the economy. The best measure of this is the OMB report uh, submitted annually to Congress, the last one covering the last 10 years of major Federal regulations, found total benefits of between $128 and $616 billion and costs of no more than $43 to $55 billion. Now, this finding refers to aggregate net benefits, which means that some individual regulations may not have benefits that exceed costs. But in our experience, this result usually results from the difficulty of monetizing regulatory benefits rather than the lack of any such benefits. Second, retrospective studies show that industry estimates of regulatory costs submitted to agencies for purposes of rulemaking are often too high. This result should be not be surprising. Regulated entities have strong incentives to overstate potential costs to regulators and to Congress. As Representative Quigley pointed out, uh, the National Association of Manufacturers had dire predictions for the Clean Air Act, none of which were borne out. Third, a recent study on regulatory costs authored by Nicole and Mark Crane for the SBA Office of Advocacy, which claims regulation had an annual cost of $1.75 trillion in 2008, is unreliable evidence concerning regulatory costs. I discuss this study in detail in my written testimony. Let me mention only one problem. About 70 percent of the regulatory costs estimated by Crane and Crane are based largely on a decidedly unusual data source for economists, public opinion polling, the results of which Crane and Crane massage into a massive but unsupported estimate of the costs of economic regulation. Because Crane and Crane have refused to make their underlying data or calculations public, apparently even withholding them from the Small Business Administration office that contracted for the study, it is difficult to know precisely how they arrived at the result that economic regulation has a cost of $1.2 trillion. Nevertheless, based on what we know, we should be wary of their claim. 
As mentioned, their estimate of economic regulatory costs is based on the results of public opinion polling, specifically polls concerning the business climate of countries that has been collected in a World Bank report. The authors of the World Bank report warned that its results should not be used for exactly the type of extrapolations made by Crane and Crane because their underlying data are too crude. Finally, like any spending, the costs of, regulate gener costs of regulation generate economic activity because the money is spent on goods and services, thereby generating jobs. As also pointed out this morning, uh, the literature does not support the conclusion that regulation retards economic recovery. In my written testimony, I describe some of the study's finding that regulation does not lead to a net job loss. One of these studies, by Resources for the Future, concludes that the claim that regulatory spending, quote, reduces employment in heavily polluting industries is not supported by the data. I might note that this includes petroleum refining, which was discussed this morning as being disadvantaged by regulation. I would also like to point out um, that studies by Eben Goodstein, also mentioned this morning, talking about pollution havens and why jobs are sent overseas, uh, Dr. Goodstein found that by the, the, the large amount of the percentage of difference in costs between manufacturing jobs here and in places like India and China are wage related to wages and that only maybe 1 or 2 percent of the difference in costs between manufacturing abroad and manufacturing here can be related to regulation. So I thank you for the opportunity to uh, testify. Although it is clear that regulated entities do not always like regulation, this does not mean that regulation is the cause or even a contributor to our economic and unemployment woes. The evidence to back up this claim is simply not there. I thank the gentleman. Ms. Kerrigan. Good afternoon, Chairman Issa, Ranking Member Cummings, and members of the committee. Uh, we appreciate the opportunity to be part of this hearing today, and we thank you for your leadership in drawing attention to the issue of regulatory impediments to job creation. Over the past several years, the regulatory pendulum has swung in a direction that is of great concern to small businesses. During the most challenging period of the recession where business owners were experiencing very weak sales, tight credit, along with other competitive business pressures, Washington churned out an array of costly policies that served to compound the poor confidence and outlook that was so pervasive in the small business community. The fear associated with economic stability, along with a highly active government where such actions create uncertainty and new costs, has not been conducive to investment and job creation. Now, with some improvement in the economy, there are signs that business outlook is also improving somewhat. Certainly, the new tone and recent initiatives from the White House, including the new regulatory strategy, is a welcome sign. But we must remember that the regulatory agencies will remain highly active and in areas with economy-wide impact. For example, they are at work implementing the health care law, the new health care law, which many small business owners are concerned about with respect to its cost. There are other significant regulations and activity underway at the EPA, the Department of Labor, and other agencies. So given the fact that existing regulatory initiatives are in motion and small businesses remain concerned about their costs, they will also remain skittish about hiring. They have real concerns about direct and indirect costs associated with these regulations that are currently in the pipeline. I have noted in my testimony the specific concerns about the new health care law, the Affordable Care Act, both the known and the unknowns that will impact hiring decisions uh, in the short and long term. With respect to the cost of energy, business owners are worried about gas and electricity prices. Along with new EPA regulations that will raise prices, they see what is occurring with offshore drilling bans, delayed permits, and how various players in our energy industry are being affected by the Federal Government's switching course on production projects, which will affect the supply and price of energy. I also would mention that this will affect the many uh, small players uh, that uh, operate in, this industry, in the energy industry and the thousands of small businesses whose livelihoods are dependent upon a vibrant energy sector. Over at the Department of Labor, uh, there is a departure away from helping businesses comply with the law 
toward an approach that seems more focused on generating complaints and grievances and collecting penalties and fines. The Department's new plan, protect, prevent regulatory initiatives has the potential to add vast amount of paperwork and time-consuming work for small businesses. So as a small business owner, you are not only continue to look at the uncertainty of the economy, you are also looking at new regulation and costs that will permeate your entire business, labor, energy, financial services, the cost and availability of credit and capital, the cost of raw materials and supplies, health coverage, and a boatload of new paperwork. And this is on top of a regulatory framework that is already, already burdensome for small businesses. And make no mistake, small businesses are disproportionately impacted by regulation. This has been documented uh, by um, the fine work and the peer-reviewed work of the Small Business Office of Advocacy, showing that the per employee cost of regulation for small business is 36 percent higher than for larger firms. The cumulative cost of regulation is putting U.S. businesses at a competitive disadvantage. Particularly in this tough economic uh, period, it is deterring job creation. President Obama wants to make the U.S. the best place in the world to do business, and we do share that goal. But the U.S. will not maintain or improve its status under the current regulatory approach. So we look forward to working with the Committee and Congress on solutions to improve the regulatory system and help small businesses do what they do best, and that is to innovate, add value, and create jobs. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Ellick. Thank you, Chairman Issa, uh, Ranking Member, Member Cummings, members of the Committee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. My name is Jerry Ellig. I am a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Uh, I have also served in two out of three branches of the United States Government. Uh, I was a senior economist at the Joint Economic Committee on Capitol Hill some years ago and served as a deputy director of the Office of Policy Planning at the Federal Trade Commission. Uh, I don't envy the members of this committee uh, or staff of this committee trying to grapple with this issue. You have recently received about 2,000 pages of submissions in response to Chairman Issa's initial requests, and it looks like more is on the way via the website. Uh, you have already heard a lot of conflicting claims, and you are going to hear more conflicting claims. You are going to hear conflicting claims from advocates who say that regulation is all benefit and no cost, and you are going to hear claims from people who say that regulation is all cost and no benefit. Uh, particularly to committee staff, I want to say, having been in government, I have walked a mile in your moccasins and I feel your pain. You have heard a lot of conflicting claims. You will hear more. Well, as Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan was reputed to have said, everybody is entitled to his own opinion, but not to his own facts. So how do we actually get the facts about the effects of regulation, both the benefit side and the cost side? How do we, under, how do we get a better grip, grip on what regulation produces that we like and also the things we have to give up in order to get that? Well, the Federal Government already has a longstanding method for doing this. It is laid out in uh, executive, presidential executive orders. President Obama's recent executive order uh, reiterated and reaffirmed these standards for assessing the effects of regulations. It is also laid out in guidance from the Office of Management and Budget in a document called Circular A-4. Presidents of both parties have issued these executive orders, laid out procedures for agencies to analyze regulations, laid out processes for regulatory review. And this has been going on for decades, so this is not new. A good regulatory impact analysis, which is, which is what these documents are about, a good regulatory impact analysis gives us answers to question like, questions like, what outcomes of direct value to the public does the regulation produce? Not just compliance, not just enforcement, but what actual results that the public benefits from are produced. What failure of the private market or failure of previous policy or other systemic problem is the regulation likely to solve? Systemic problem, not just are there a few anecdotes or are there a few bad actors that could be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis? What are the alternative solutions? Because regulation is rarely an, a yes-no on-off switch. There are alternative ways to do, th to do things that we should be looking at. And finally, what are the pros and cons of the alternatives, or in economics jargon, costs and benefits? These are the kinds of things that people are arguing about in front of this hearing, and this creates kind of a puzzle, because if Federal regulatory agencies are already supposed to be assessing the effects of regulation, 
why do businesses, why do advocacy organizations, why do other kinds of interested parties feel like they have to come to Congress for redress? Why didn't the agencies sort this all out when they issued the regulations? Part of the answer, I think, is that agencies often don't do the kind of comprehensive, high-quality analysis that fully identifies all of a regulation's effects. Uh, experience shows that it takes more than words in an executive order to get good analysis done uh, or to get for good analysis to, analysis to get used when agencies issue regulations. Since 2008, some of my colleagues and I at the Mercatus Center have had a project that we call the Regulatory Report Card, where we assess the quality of analysis that Federal agencies do when they issue regulations and the extent to which the agencies claim to use that when they make their decisions. This is a project on assessing the quality and completeness of the analysis, not a project on evaluating whether we like or don't like the regulations. Our criteria are drawn from Executive Order 12866, OMB Circular A4. Essentially, what the question we are trying to answer is, how well are agencies doing the things that Presidents have been telling them to do for more than 30 years? Those are our criteria. We found some reasonably good, reasonably good analyses. Uh, we found a lot more that are seriously incomplete. If these analyses were student papers, the best grade would be a B minus, the average would be an F. I don't think that's good enough to guide decisions that affect our health, that affect our safety, and affect our economy. Uh, here are some of the common problems we find. Uh, a lot of times, believe it or not, uh, regulations don't uh, do a good job of explaining what outcomes the regulation is supposed to produce. A lot of times we find that there's, rare, there's rarely an explanation or evidence of the existence of a market failure or a systemic problem. The agency just says, well, Congress passed this law, told us to issue this regulation, so this is what we're going to do. In about half of the cases, the agencies don't identify alternative regulatory options or they don't give them anything more than cursory analysis. And only a minority of these uh, analyses offer a really comprehensive look at costs and benefits or uh, explain how the regulation actually affected a decision the agency made. Now, we also find a lot of best practices that could substantially improve regulatory analysis if they were more widely shared. Clearly, the knowledge of how to do good regulatory analysis exists and is spread throughout the Federal Government. The problem is the incentives. There are institutional incentives that reduce agencies' incentive to uh, produce good analysis and also um, re reduce agencies' incentive to use the analysis when they do it. I have a lot of ideas in my written testimony for reforms that could help solve this problem. A few possible ideas require the agencies to actually explain how they use their analysis in the Federal Register Notice when they propose regulations, require agencies to publish the analysis before they write the regulation and make decisions instead of writing the analysis after they wrote the regulation, requiring them to publish the data and the models so that independent scholars or other outside folks who are interested could do their own analysis as a quality check on what the agency did. Now, I have a lot of other ideas in my written testimony. The common and in the Q&A, we will give you plenty of opportunity to talk about them. Oh, okay. No, don't worry. I wasn't going to give you another, another list. The, the, the bottom line is this, that in order to get good regulatory analysis and get it used, we need institutional reforms that will put teeth in the executive order. Thank you. I now recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Gattuso, in your opening statement, you, uh, you talked about the President Obama's latest executive order. I have a concern. As I understand the executive order, it doesn't cover independent agencies. Is that correct? Th that is correct. So FCC, SEC, I mean, the list is, the what, two-thirds of government is in, in regulations or in independent agencies, if you leave the EPA out, maybe more than that? Yeah, in, in terms of actually calculated cost, EPA is by far the largest, but a lot of the independent agency, agencies, especially the FCC, do not uh, uh, calculate cost, do not do a cost-benefit analysis. But it's the Federal Communications Commission, the Federal Trade Commission, the uh, Securities and Exchange Commission. It's a, it's a long list. You know, I, uh, my industry that I came from, the electronics industry, FCC was, was king. Uh, and I didn't get to say this in the first round, but maybe because we have such a scholarly round, the FCC's failure to supply bandwidth uh, solutions for more data capability that the market wants, that Mr. Cummings wants, that, that my uh, constituents want, uh, is that an impediment 
I mean, are those some of the impediments where we see the FCC passing rules, but we don't see them using their assets to provide the expansion of the economy? It, it certainly is an impediment. Uh, the, you know, the FCC actually has in, improved its policies over the past decade or so, uh, allowing more and, and more flexible use of, of a spectrum, but there is a lot still to be done. Um, if I mentioned also in independent agencies that there, uh, some, some reports have said that the President is unable legally to uh, involve the independent agencies in, its, in his review. So, so what you are saying is the President can't, but we could? Well, no. What I am saying is that those reports are wrong. Um, uh, oh. in, in 1991. So he could and we could require well, this? Well, in fact, it has been done before. In 1992, uh, President Bush uh, had a regulatory review and moratorium uh, that, that, uh, in, in which every independent agency participated. All, all, that happened, all that was required was for the President to ask the chairman of each agency to participate. Everyone said yes. Uh, and, and I think President Obama could get the same result if he were to ask. Thank you. Uh, early, the earlier panel talked about a particular uh, uh, new regulation, an EPA one, a boiler MACT, uh, MACT. Uh, how often do you, in your analysis, see regulations where they create a regulation, then have to go to the court to try to delay it because, in fact, it can't be implemented? Uh, in, like that one where it's, I guess in three days it is going to become law without there actually being technology to make it work, and they have admitted that in their own statements. Is that something that you see uh, in, in other areas? You know, I, I can't think of a case where that has happened before. I mean, uh, I am sure it has, but I, I think it would be extremely rare for, for an agency to reverse itself that uh, uh, significantly. But they haven't reversed themselves. They have just gone to the court for relief from their own rule. Well, that's rule. true. That's true. Although they reversed themselves in the sense that, that they, they apparently did think the rule was justified and now they are having second thoughts. Okay. Well, I am going to ask a specific question to Mr. Shapiro. Uh, you are on record, and I quote, as saying, about cost-benefit analysis. It is neither sound in theory nor useful in practice. Now, when the President uh, wants a cost-benefit analysis, does that mean that you disagree with President Obama when he is looking for regulatory relief that, that looks at cost-benefit? Or is it in your testimony today basically that you want to figure out once something is a law, if it has got a benefit, then you should do a cost-benefit? But if, if you are going to make it, you shouldn't consider. I am a little confused because it appears as though basically you are very happy not having cost benefit when they put the regulation on, and then when industry says it is costing us billions or millions, et cetera, that, as you said, they, quote, exaggerate, that basically they have to prove that it is killing them or you don't want the regulation removed. Did I understand that correctly, Mr. Shapiro? Uh I am not quite sure of your understanding, but perhaps Well, you have said cost-benefit analysis in, of, in of that course. quote is not a useful practice, and yet the President thinks it is. Democrats here on the dais thought it should be. Uh, Ms. Kerrigan, should we, in fact, have a cost-benefit analysis? Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. May I answer the question? Well, you didn't seem to, to be interested in answering, but I will come back to you. Ms. Kerrigan, should we, in fact, as a body, make sure that there is a cost-benefit analysis done by government, open to scrutiny, before regulation occurs, as uh, Mr. Ellick had suggested? Oh, absolutely. I, and I think that is particularly important for small businesses, because they do, uh, there is a disproportionate uh, impact on small businesses, and I think that rigorous analysis uh, needs to be done. Um, so it is vitally important, and it, it would be a, a, a tremendous of tremendous value uh, to small businesses and the business communities if the agencies were required to do that. Thank you. And my time has expired, but I don't want to shortchange Mr. Shapiro. Uh, would you answer whether you still stand behind your, ninth, your 2009 white paper, January, in which you said uh, the problem with and so and so and cost benefit analysis is neither sound in theory nor useful in practice? You st still stand behind that? I do. What we were talking Thank about. Thank you. I now recognize the ranking member. In courtesy to you, and I apologize for the chairman, uh, I would like to hear your answer to his question. Thank you. Uh, if you look at all the major laws uh, that involve the protection of people and the environment, um, with only two exceptions that I know about, Congress does not require 
that a regulation pass a cost-benefit test in order to implement the regulation. There is very good reason for that. In all of these laws, Congress wanted to be protective. Uh, it wanted to protect the American people and the environment to the extent that was practicable and reasonable, and it has therefore set the laws in having this aspirational goal. Now, that doesn't mean we shouldn't be interested in cost-benefit analysis, because we should analyze the efficiency costs of this aspirational goal, and that is what we do in cost-benefit analysis. Unfortunately, it is difficult to apply cost-benefit analysis because many, many of the benefits are difficult to monetize. So while uh, you have heard proposals here today that we should have additional analysis, we should study these things more, um, I don't object to that except for the caveat that we recognize going in of the great difficulty of monetizing the value of the benefits. What is a life worth? Uh, what is a fish worth? We can talk about it, but there are really severe limitations in using the methodology. Let me ask you this. Um, you know, it is interesting. Uh, these regulations uh, have been put forth by both Republican and Democratic administrations. And as a former small business person, I, I, I sympathize. I really do with small business. Uh, and any business that have to go through some of these things. But as I listen to what you just said, um, so is it your theory, Mr. Is it yours? I want to make, make sure I'm saying this right. When the government puts forth these um, regulations, are you saying that they're more concerned about a, the general protection of the public? Is that what you're trying to say? Yes, uh, that is correct. Many, although not all, of these regulations basically work as technology-based regulations. So what Congress has said to the agencies is we want to do the best we can to protect the American public, taking costs into account. So what we would like you to do is go out and find the best available technology, uh, which would not cause severe financial dislocation for an industry, and we want you to require them to use the best available technology to protect the public. That is essentially how many of these laws work. All right. Let me ask you this. Um, a little bit earlier, I described how some of the major corporations we heard from had skyrocketing profits uh, over the last two years. For example, Chevron's profits soared from $10.5 billion in 2009 to $19 billion in 2010. And ConocoPhillips' profits went from $4.4 billion to $11.4 billion more than doubling in a year. But when we looked at the responses, a lot of these companies wanted uh, to repeal corporate transparency provisions in the Wall Street Reform Bill. And these seem to have nothing to do with job creation. Let me ask you about one example. The first regulation identified by ConocoPhillips was a requirement that all companies and other resource extraction issuers disclose their payments to foreign governments to access oil, gas, and minerals. Senator Richard Lugar, a well-respected Republican, good friend, was one of the primary proponents of this provision, and he said, the essential issue at stake is a citizen's right to hold its government to account. We cannot force foreign governments to treat their citizens as we, as we hope, but this amendment would make it much more difficult to hide the truth. So my first question is, why would ConocoPhillips want to keep their payments to foreign governments secret? And, and, well, as I understand the point of today's hearing, we are trying to be, uh, identify regulations that impair job creation. So here is my second question. If we agreed with ConocoPhillips and repealed this provision, would that create any jobs in America? Mr. Shapiro? Uh, I think this shows the reason why, uh, why we need to uh, broaden our focus beyond regulatory costs. Uh, this is a regulatory cost to those companies. So besides whatever embarrassment might come out of revealing this information, there are paperwork and other costs to the company. And uh, there could be a debate over whether that is necessary, as you have heard before. Uh, but in order to evaluate whether that is necessary, we have to look at the broader picture of the benefits as well as the costs, benefits which are monetized or not. Thank you. In order to be fair, I'm going to try and do a little quick second round. Uh, I'm 
from the private sector, so maybe uh, maybe I see things differently. Mr. Shapiro, I, uh, I got, took your yes, you still stand by it for an answer, so I was glad that the ranking member allowed you to elaborate. Of course. But let me understand this. You think it is a good idea for a U.S. flagged business to disclose what it pays, remembering we are one of the few countries in the world that does not allow, if you will, bribes. We make it a crime to pay a commission to somebody to get a deal. But the details of a contract, let's say in Kazakhstan or, you know, you name the country, if, if, if the details have to be made public by a U.S. flag company, well, BP, which is not U.S. flagged, or a Russian company doesn't, then if I understand, you think it is just fine for that legal but private and it, and it, a private transaction to be made available to their competitors while the other isn't, meaning they always know what price they have to beat from us while, in fact, we don't know what price they are paying. And meantime, the French, the Russians and all the others, on top of we don't know what they are paying, are able to pay bribes with impunity. I, you, you really think that naively on global business? Is that correct? Mr. Chairman, I was trying to make a broader point. Uh, my area of academic well, okay, specialty. But, but so, so in, in this particular case, you are not speaking to those kinds of issues. You are thinking more broadly of regulatory uh, compliance. Is that right? I think we need to have the conversation that the Chairman indicated uh, he would like to have, and that is looking at both benefits and costs. Okay. Uh, because I am very concerned that uh, the Ranking Member has repeatedly, uh, throughout this hearing, talked about Chevron and Conoco and other companies, I guess what he misses is the vast majority of these large increases occurred in their outside the U.S. operations. They are growing very fast on profits made by buying overseas and selling overseas, and then those look like profits in the U.S. Well, in fact, in the first panel, and I think we are hearing it broadly in the second panel, we realize that American jobs are not being created through American mining, manufacture, and agriculture, and we are here today, and I would like to have everyone make a closing statement uh, as to this. We are here because it appears as though part of the impediment to U.S. job creations, not U.S. profits by doing business globally and making in China and selling to uh, Europe, but U.S. jobs, those kinds of jobs we all grew up being proud of, working at the auto, steel, and rubber plants, working, working at the stamping operation, those jobs are the jobs we think may be disappearing. Uh, I would go down the panel of, do you believe, and this is a fairly simple question, although you can elaborate, do you believe there is any credence to looking for at least one impediment to U.S. job creation here? Is that, is that frivolous? Or, in fact, are we on the right track to try to get those mining, agriculture, and, mi and manufacturing jobs back in America? I, I think you are definitely on the right track. Uh, there, there are costs. Now, there, it, it does, that does not mean that every regulation is bad. That does not mean that no regulations are needed. But there are many that are bad. There are many that are necessary and many that are harmful. It is not an easy task to identify those, but that is what makes the project more important. Frankly, it is the easiest thing in the world for an agency to come up with a new regulation, to, to get it through, and uh, certainly all the incentives for, for, for an agency head or an agency staffer are to expand their, their, their um, jurisdiction. Thank we need you. to, to uh, be vigilant to make sure that that bias is overcome. Thank you, Mr. Shapiro, to that question. Uh, this is an important this is an important aspect of uh, congressional oversight, and I think everyone appreciates uh, that you are doing it. Uh, but we need to also look at the evidence. Um, Stephen Meyer of MIT uh, has done two studies. He compared economic performance uh, in states with strict environmental regulation and economic performance in states with lesser environmental regulation. And he uh, found uh, that states with stronger environmental regulation had little difference in economic performance from those states with weaker standards. There was an intervening reception, so recession, so he went back and did it again to see whether the recession made a difference, and he concluded the results were the same. Stronger environmental standards have not limited the relative pace of economic growth and development among the states over the past 20 years. Thank you. Ms. Kerrigan. I, I think we are definitely on the right track. I do, do think we need to be looking at this. Um, you know, labor and capital is highly mobile in our global economy. I have traveled around the world uh, working with governments and business leaders and business associations in, in developing and emerging countries 
who are looking at what they can do to make their economies more competitive, what they can do to attract investment, to help their small business sector. So, um, you know, there are other countries out there that, that, that know that they need to work on their internal processes in order, you know, in order to attract investment, and, and it is very competitive. And quite frankly, they do want to eat our lunch. So um, I, I think it is important that we do. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Mr. Ellick. Uh, two points. On the cost side, um, regulatory uncertainty, there is evidence that uncertainty does deter business investment, which may deter job creation. And my, my colleague, Dr. Richard Williams, 27-year veteran of the Food and Drug Administration, made that point in his submission in response to your, to your request. Uh, secondly, the, more, the broader point is regulation reallocates resources. We get more of some things as a result of regulation. We get less of other things. The less of other things is the cost side. That may show up as lower employment than we would, we would otherwise have. That may show up as lower wages. That may show up as higher prices for consumers. Or it may show up as less, in, less investment if we, treat, if we regard regulation as something that just comes out of profit. That's, that's the cost of saying, well, we'll take it out of profit. Uh, we have less incentives for investment. Typically, those effects will be different for different industries and for different types of regulation, which is why it is so hard to generalize. I thank the gentleman. And I uh, note the, uh, the attendance of the gentlelady from New York. I apologize for not catching you earlier, Ms. Burko, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Since the uh, beginning of uh, the formation of this committee and my membership on it, our chairman has charged us to go out and begin a conversation with uh, all entities, businesses, small businesses, larger businesses, and our constituents to talk with them and listen to their concerns regarding regulations and how these regulations impede their success and how those regulations really snuff out the entrepreneurial spirit that has made this country the great nation that she is. So I am delighted to be here today and have the opportunity to greet uh, all of you today, and I thank you for being here. My first question is a general question, and I will start with Mr. Gattuso, but then if anyone else would like to comment, I would certainly welcome that. At, at his State of the Union address, we heard the President speak about regulations and the need to get regulations uh, under control so that we do not uh, impede jobs and getting this economy back on track. I would like to uh, hear from you whether or not you think that that is a serious initiative that is going to be taken or what, what your thoughts are about that. I would like to think that it is a serious initiative and I would welcome a serious initiative along those lines. Uh, I have uh, considerable concerns, however, uh, from, from what actually has been done so far. The, the executive order released by the President, issued by the President, only calls for preliminary plans for a review of regulation sometimes in the future. It is not the government-wide review uh, that, that, that he has stated it was. Uh, it does not apply to independent agencies who are some of the largest producers of regulations. And it seems each time he talks about this initiative, there is less and less um, uh, on why we need to review regulations and more on defending regulations. Uh, so the, 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 the tenor seems, the, the uh, um, uh, initiative seems to be uh, perhaps fading already, which is a matter of great concern. Uh, just uh, um, the, to, to cap it off, um, I, I was very disappointed in his speech to the U.S. Chamber where he seemed to rely upon cajoling um, a business uh, uh, to hire, to uh, uh, claim moral imperatives, uh, appeals to patriotism, basically jawboning as opposed to real policy change. Um, he even went so far, and actually a humorous note, said that he, he, he wished he had brought a fruitcake over to, to, to the Chamber of Commerce when he moved into the neighborhood to, to welcome them and establish a friendship. And that's good. We, we should have good relations between different uh, uh, factions in, in politics, but fruitcakes won't do it. So we need more than fruitcake economics to, uh, to get this problem solved. Thank you. Would any other members like to? Yes, sir. Uh, thank you for this opportunity to answer your question. Um, I think the President is seriously interested in this, but he also feels the um, responsibility to do it in a balanced way, um, that these regulations and these laws are important because they also protect people and they protect the environment. And uh, at least regarding some of the aspects of that, we also need to move ahead. Um, agencies uh, have limited resources, and to the extent they are pulled off on lookbacks, of course, 
that also uh, limits their ability to go forward. Uh, finally, I think the President knows to the extent we have done these lookbacks in the past, we have generally found that costs are less than projected at the time and benefits are about the same as we thought. Uh, there have been very few lookbacks that have found that we are chasing uh, after problems that are really not serious uh, societal problems. Just if I could comment on, on your response, I think that everyone on the committee is very concerned and interested in always maintaining the balance between public safety and uh, safety in the job place or whatever the issue is, but also the, the need to get this economy back on track and create jobs. So thank you. I think time will tell. I, we're, we're, we're hopeful, um, you know, and we'll uh, take part in the initiative with the White House. Um, the key is, though, is, is that the initiative, the spirit of the initiative, also going to be um, uh, implemented with uh, the existing regulations that are moving through the system right now, you know, with the new health care, the financial service uh, overhaul laws, um, you know, some of the things that are moving through the Department of Labor right now. Um, not only just to look back, but, uh, you know, are we in fact, um, you know, looking at, you know, the cost? Uh, on small business and what we can do to, you know, if they are going to move forward with the, these regulations, are they taking small businesses into a, account? You know, will they be exempted? Is there going to be an alternative uh, that uh, perhaps makes it uh, easier, easier and less burdensome for them to comply? Um, but with these initiatives, it is a lot of time, energy and passion that is going to be needed from the White House. And uh, again, time will tell. Uh, we will see. Thank you. I believe we are out of time, unless I can. I, I appreciate it. The gentlelady's time has expired. Thank you. And with that, I recognize the ranking member of the committee, uh, Mr. Cummings of Maryland. Thank you very much. As I, <coughs> so I want to thank you, win the witnesses, for an excellent testimony. And as I was sitting here, I could not help but think about uh, about 40 years ago when I sat as a, uh, an employee of Bethlehem Steel in Baltimore. And it was interesting back then that um, we spent a whole day just on safety regulations be before we could do anything. And, but there was something that makes me feel very emotional as I am sitting here. And that is, is that, and I did not realize the significance of it then, but I understand it now. At the end of the day, if you blew your nose, as a matter of fact, if you were on the premises for an hour and you blew your nose, black stuff would come out. Not trying to ruin your lunch, but that meant that we were inhaling. We were making a decent salary, Mr. Shapiro and Ms. Kerrigan. We had a summer job, which we really needed. Mm -hmm. One of the highest paying jobs that we could get, really, as a student after my 11th grade and 12th grade year. But we were also inhaling stuff that would kill us. And it was even more evidence, I have evidence of that, because a lot of the gentlemen that I work with who were making a lot of money died early. They are dead. They are no longer there for their children. They didn't even get a chance to see many of their grandchildren. They are dead. And I think that what we have to constantly keep in mind is this whole balancing act. And, Mr. Shapiro, you, I, I think you, you said something that I haven't heard any of the witnesses talk about, and that is that it sounds like you, you were saying that when these regulations are made, government bends on the side of protecting human life, bends towards human safety and the welfare of, of people. I, I think that's what you're saying. And so, so I think that, and, and I keep, this keeps going on in my mind. When I think about Bethlehem Steel and I think about those people who are dead and I think about the ones who called me when I was in college to tell me that they were suffering from cancer and all kinds of problems because of what they inhaled. And so I think that later on when things came, came around uh, and OSHA began to look at some of that, I think they began to require certain other things like a mask, like a simple mask over one's face. So regulations do have a significant role to play with regard to life and death situations. And so um, I just want us to always keep that in mind. Some people want to try to make it look as if uh, 
is one side or the other. I think it's a, it's a balancing act. It really is. Um, and no one wants to overburden business, but, but it's one thing to have a job. It's another thing to be able to go home at the end of the day and not be shipped off in a coffin. That's real. And so I think we have to maintain that. Now, let me go back to something else. Uh, we were talking about Conoco, and I want to make it clear, Mr. Shapiro, that Senator Luger is no wacko. He's a brilliant man who I admire tremendously, well-respected Republican. He said, when he was talking about this provision, he said, the essential issue at stake is a citizen's right to hold his government to account. We cannot force foreign governments to treat their citizens as we would hope. But this amendment would make it much more difficult to hide the truth. And uh, you can comment on that in a minute, but I, w I need to get w one thing in, Mr. Chairman, before I uh, do that. I want to get some letters in real quick. I ask unanimous consent to enter into the record three additional letters we received for this hearing. These letters are from Robert and Susan Cerilli Gliano, uh, who lost their son Bobby when he was suffocated by a drop side crib. Uh, another letter from the, the small business majority of small business advocacy organization that supports the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. And finally, the Main Street Alliance, an organization that re represents small businesses and supports the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act. I ask that they be uh, part of the record, Ms. Mr. Chairman. Without objection. And I see I still have 23 sec 21 seconds. Mr. Perry, do you want to comment very quickly because I've run out of time just about? Representative uh, Cummings, there is a very good reason that uh, the agencies bend towards the protection of people trying to prevent injuries, cancers, and so on and so forth. That's what Congress told them to do in the OSHA Act and these other laws. Mm, right. Thank you very much. I thank the ranking member, and, uh, and I recognize myself for five minutes. Uh, Ms. Kerrigan, uh, so in terms of small business, you, you say in your testimony that small businesses, um, well, first, they are important to the American economy, and I, I agree. And I think most Americans, um, middle America agrees as well. Um, but you, all, you stated that small businesses bear a regulatory burden that is greater than a large business. Mm -hmm. Explain that. Do it, just flesh that out for me. Well, it is quite simple, and, and it is and common sense that, you know, when a new regulation is imposed on a business, whether it is a tax, a new tax requirement, a new reporting uh, requirement, um, when there is compliance involved, that they just do not have the scale um, to, um, you know, spread the costs around. And uh, they do not have a, uh, an accounting, uh, many of them do not have accounting a department or they do not have a compliance person or they don't have a vice president uh, of safety. So, you know, it is, it is the, the business owner. Uh, it falls on them to, um, you know, to, uh, you know, deal with that new regulation. They may have to, um, um, you know, hire a consultant, uh, perhaps um, uh, bring on an accountant as, an, as a consultant or, uh, you know, or perhaps, you know, give them more hours or, or what have you. So uh, it, it, they just do not have, they can't, you know, uh, uh, absorb those costs as easily as a large enterprise. And so, um, you know, that, that is the, the spirit behind, uh, in 1980, the Regulatory Flex Act, that there was, you know, the common sense premise that regulation does have a disproportionate impact on small business. And therefore, you know, the agencies do need to take that into account uh, in terms of their, their regulatory actions. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Elledge, uh, in terms of uh, the Mercatus Institute does a uh, report card uh, of this regulatory burden. Can you uh, mention that? Oh, yeah, sure. Our, our project is essentially looking at the quality of analysis that Federal agencies do when they issue regulations and then looking at, you know, to what extent did they actually seem to use it in making decisions. And this, this is not uh, we are not trying to suggest that agencies ought to be in a straitjacket where they have some quantitative formula that they can only issue a regulation if the monetized benefits exceed the monetized costs, but rather we are looking for whether uh, agencies actually you know, seriously considered 
uh, regulatory alternatives? Did they actually define the problem they are trying to solve and explain the barrier that gets in the way of achieving whatever it is the regulation is supposed to achieve? Did Thank they demonstrate you. that this problem exists and so forth? So that is the kind of thing we are looking at. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I yield the balance of my time to my colleague from New York. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Ellig, this question is for you. In your written testimony, you mentioned that interviews with agency economists uh, often uh, sh revealed that they faced pressure to modify their analysis uh, of the regulations in order to support decisions that were already made. I wonder if you could uh, expound on that for the committee and just tell us what agencies you were referring to. Oh, sure. That that's, is based on a study. Uh, there was a series of structured interviews of Federal economists in uh, various health and safety agencies that was actually conducted by uh, one of my colleagues, Dr. Richard Williams, uh, shortly after he left the FDA. And that was one of the generalizations that he drew from his interviews. Um, personally, I have heard stories of agency economists saying that they were told things like on a Friday, um, come back and put more benefits in the, this analysis or don't bother showing up for work on Monday. I, th I think, and I think among economists who do this kind of, for, kind of thing in a li for a living in federal agencies, it's, it's well known that they are going to get some pressure to uh, come up with an analysis that supports what are, whatever the agency has decided to do, whether it is an increase in regulation or a decrease in regulation. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Uh, thank you. I certainly appreciate it. And I certainly appreciate the, the chairman giving me the opportunity to sit in the chair. And it is a uh, mighty big chair for a guy my size. So uh, with that, uh, there are no more questions uh, today. So with that, the committee stands adjourned.